Hey listeners, it's Alex, your host of EOA Entrepreneurs of Asia, a show where we have genuine conversations with founders, investors, and entrepreneurs about their journeys and the lessons they've learned, highlighting the depth and nuance that Asia has to offer. For today's episode, I sit down with one of my besties, the master of the high ground, Dave Chang. This episode was a doozy. It's a four-hour podcast broken down into two parts. Dave starts off with his investment thesis that he's been developing over the past few years called the Unified Bundling Theory of Economics, or in other words, Technologically Driven Bundling and Unbundling Theory. For the first half of part one, Dave explains on a very high level the historical context of his idea, and then we explore it in the world of media, from gaming to music, movies, and e-commerce. In the second part of the episode, we hear about Dave's background from being born in communist China and how he ended up being raised as a Midwest all-American kid. Dave is also a survivor of the War of a Thousand Competitors, in the Group by History of China. He's a part of the Groupon gang that was under Groupon International and run by Rocket Internet vis-a-vis the Samware Brothers back in 2010. Dave shares his experience and what happened in Groupon China and a bit of Rocket Internet history and philosophy. After that, he recounts his tales building a Korean beauty startup and how he would do it all over again. He also shares the most important thing he learned from Groupon, his experiences working in America's famous satire news outlet, The Onion. And lastly, towards the end, we get a little bit more philosophical and discuss the best way to do good for the world. This was one of my favorite podcast sessions thus far, and I learned a lot. So let's dive right in and listen. Dave Chang, welcome to the show. Hey, man. Good to be here. Yes. Look, I'm, uh, Cheers. I'm very excited that we finally got to do this. Yes. So let, let me give a brief introduction to Dave. Uh, Dave, my good friend of many years now, right? Uh, I think we met four or five years ago yeah. at, a, at an, an Amazing Grays event. And we were yeah. both like lonely and had no one to talk to. <laughs> That's how I make most of my friends. And honestly, uh, everyone, it's always these networking things for business or entrepreneurship. And yeah. Yeah. You, I always find the guy who's like, he looks pretty antisocial. Let's, let's, let's talk to him. Yeah. And yeah. Then, then it usually works out. We become good friends. <laughs> I, I thought the same thing about you. You were like, I remember because you were sitting in like the Starbucks next to where the event was taking place and you were like by yourself at the table by the window. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, I have to engage someone. Yeah. So I might as well be this guy. <laughs> but you're okay. So before we get into you, yeah. I'll, I'll give a quick brief bullet point uh, profile of who you are, your experiences, so people have an idea. Sure. So they know where they're kind, kind of heading. Uh, born and raised in where? Uh, well, so it's an interesting question. I was actually born in Qingdao, Qingdao China, 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 Qingdao of the famous Qingdao brewery. And okay. I immigrated to the States when I was five and a half, five and a half, five and a half. Yeah. Okay. We moved to, uh, there's a whole story about that if you yeah. want to get into it, but my parents were, um, researchers. Yeah. So my father was doing his postdoc, uh, in Oklahoma. Okay, of all places. Yeah, in Oklahoma, of all places. And uh, I moved there, lived in Oklahoma for about a year and a half. And then we moved to Wisconsin. So, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, you know, very Midwestern. Yeah. So, es- yeah. essentially, grew up, though, in, mis- in uh, Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, effectively. Correct. Yeah, so, uh, Wisconsin, I guess, raised in a sense. You can say raised. Yeah. I, I think Wisconsin I think, raised. Yeah. 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 Uh, then went to University of Minnesota. Yeah. Right. Uh, do some finance work, but uh, I think the one that's more notable is you worked for The Onion. That's true. I did work right? for The Onion, yeah. Then you did uh, Gaopeng, which was Groupon in China. Yep. After that, Living Social. Yep. Genting Casino Hotel and Resort. I don't know if the actual full name. Essentially, it's like... It's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a conglomerate. It's a conglomerate, right? So, yes. I mean, there's, there's like a bazillion different companies that yeah. you could potentially entities you work for. So, I, the one I worked for um, was called Resorts World Inc. And yeah. what they effectively did was they um, – it's this really strange structure where all of the subsidiary companies of Gunting yeah. don't own – the uh, licensing and brand rights to the mm. Resorts World brand. They mm. actually license it from the family, and the family has set up this oh, entity called okay. Resorts World Inc., yeah. which collected the license fees from the various publicly traded entities, ah, and then they okay, plowed okay. that back into R and D, some venture capital, uh-huh. uh, and sort of like it was like a almost like a shared services type thing. Yeah. But again, operated independently. Yeah. Um, there's, there's obviously a lot yeah. that we can talk about there as well. I guess they're more famous in Malaysia, but honestly, they have a giant global footprint to 
to a degree. I mean, they, they have through affiliates, like you said, like some some form of yeah licensing and, and doing business around the world. Uh, well, they just yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. I mean, they, they just opened up their their new property in Las Vegas, which is like a four point three billion uh, okay. USD development, and I believe it's like the first uh, new casino that's opened up wow. on the strip okay. in like. I, I, I'm not close to my yeah, a long time. 15, 20 years, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah, a big yeah. deal. It's yeah. a big deal. So it's definitely like yeah. a story of um, like a regional player with like these huge global ambitions. Uh, re- regional from uh, Southeast Asia. Yes. Uh, yeah. That, that global, correct. Yeah, yeah, Southeast correct. Asia. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So then after that, you were Althea, which was a Korean beauty startup, I guess you could say. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that sounds. And then wh- what are you doing now? <laughs> I, I, I really <laughs> cannot keep is, track of that this. That is a mystery. Yeah, everyone, you, everyone, you left it out of your profile on LinkedIn. I haven't updated my LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. 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 I, I need to do the same probably. Yeah, the same. <laughs> everyone has this problem, right? Yeah. Like, um, so long story short, I basically work uh, for a publicly listed company in Hong Kong that's in the middle of transitioning from a traditional business of like print and print production into mm. a media holding group. Right. Okay. So, uh, basic, okay. uh, similar to a uh, SPH in Singapore, something similar, although like we're predominantly interested in owning and investing in IP. Right. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. and I have a this like a this like a whole like economic yeah. theory that I've actually okay, yes. developed for okay. you. Yes. We're, we're going to talk about that <laughs> to next. Talk about this. Yeah. 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 So, so um, long story short, so we we manage and own IP in the U.S. and in mainland China. Those are two yeah. primary markets. Um, and so we essentially want to be um, far upstream. So yeah. in the U.S., we buy uh, screenplays, uh, so TV mm. uh, pilots and movies. Yes. And we flip them to downstream um, suppliers okay. or players. So like, why, why haven't we student. done? Why haven't we done more screenplays and writing, Dave? Ah, uh, because I'm like a finance guy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what is okay? What is people need boxes, right? What what is your title? What what exactly is your role in this kind of uh, IP conquest? So technically, my official title at the group level is I am the head of strategic ventures. Okay, very Sorry. fancy. Yeah, it's very fancy. It's, it, it yeah. bas- basically, it's a catch-all for every new project that the group wants to do okay. that you can't clearly yeah. box, okay. right? But I, I think, like, if you for the, the listeners, if you really want to apply that heuristic, right? Um, I would say numbers guy. Numbers. Okay. numbers. Okay. I started off in finance. Yeah. That was my first job, majoring in finance. I always worked in sort of like an analytics role. Like yeah. even at the Korean beauty company, I was in digital marketing, and digital marketing is just straight up performance numbers. It's performance numbers. Data. Right? Yeah. yeah. It, correct. 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 Right. Yeah. So optimization. Yeah. So at the group level, what I do a lot is I do a lot of the analytics for our portfolio companies, uh, a lot of like the market intelligence research, and also uh, the other big part of that is I do a lot of the business negotiations. So yeah. like that's the other half. It's like kind of like a bd mm. uh, i don't want to say sales because you know sales has like has that implication yeah i know what it you has mean. implications right yeah, it has, it has yeah. Impl- but you're more than that yeah i mean because you're you're putting a lot of different skills together to probably come to conclusions of how to execute on what they want to do for the portfolio and the development correct. right yeah. correct correct um okay so before we jump into what I wanted to talk about, you <laughs> prepared something. So let's, let's just go straight to that, right? Oh, so we're going to go straight to that? Okay. Yeah. We're, and this is, this is about, cause otherwise I don't know how to fit it in, right? And we're, we're talking Fair. about your current role, your current Fair job. Enough. Fair enough. Um, okay. What, what do you want to talk about? What, what, what are we bringing to the table here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I mean, like you didn't give me any, any brief or, I mean, I have a little bit of context, right? Yeah. So, so, and I think this is, uh, so for me, this is exciting. This, this is my first podcast, actually. Never done. We're breaking the podcast cherry. Yeah, I'm breaking the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and uh, I think you've had some like very thoughtful and insightful people, and it's like this is a certain bar, right? You don't want to okay. be the guy that shows yeah. up and be like, "We got to raise, we got to raise the bar." Yeah, the standards, yeah. So the standards that people need to adhere to. Um, and actually, I, I found, so I found this exercise to be incredibly valuable because what it forced me to do is it forced me to sort of codify and write down yeah. like my operational. Hypothesis strategy over the last couple of years, which is yeah. something that I've never done before. Yeah. Right. And I think it's one of these things where I don't think I'm unique, where it's like, you only really understand something when you have to explain it to someone else. The Feynman technique. Yeah. Right? Exactly. You, you, yeah. you know, break it down as simple as possible. You don't understand it. Uh, you have to re- break it down again, learn the smaller parts. And then the, I guess the, the, the one that closes the loop is you teaching it in a simple Correct. way to like someone who's like maybe six years old. Or whatever, Correct. Right. And Correct. if you could do that, you've mastered exactly. Yes. yes. And that's okay. okay. That's true mastery. Yes. That's true understanding. Exactly. Right. That's exactly where we're going. Yeah. And so 
and I've been operating with this uh, like hypothesis, but again, this is the first time I've ever put it down. So, and this is the first time I've, I've actually talked about it okay, to perfect. anyone. So I've stress tested it in my mind. Yes. But I think this is a good opportunity for yeah. both of well, us we'll put it to, out there. to toss it out there. Okay. So I call it, <laughs> to, you know, it's a working title, my unified bundling theory of economics. Okay. Okay. And I'll get in with that. Okay. Means, right? I, I hear the word bundling. Uh, is there going to be some concepts we, uh, you read from Shitechery? Or so separate? Well, I mean, so here's the thing, right? Like, I think I haven't, yeah, that's, I, I, I haven't deep dived into that, so I don't not I don't know too much about bundling and bundling, but we will be talking about that probably next week. <laughs> Let's talk about yeah. it. Yeah, so we can start now. We can start now. Yeah. So, so first of all, it's not an original idea, right? I think all ideas are built on scaffolding of, of course, people's yes. thoughts, right? Yes. So I'm, I'm yeah. not claiming that this yes, is like yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. like genius, insightful, yeah. whatever, right? So I actually stole this from Jim. Barksdale, Jim Barksdale and Mark Andreessen. So Jim Barksdale okay. was the CEO of Netscape. Yes. 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 And he, Jim Barksdale famously once said that the only way to make money in business is either via bundling or via unbundling. Okay. Right? So he's the one who probably coined, popularized this he, idea. He, he was the originator, I believe. And I think that the story is, and then Mark Andreessen is probably more commonly associated with it now, but that's, I think, mostly because Mark Andreessen is also a much name. higher yeah. Yeah, name, right? Yeah, yeah, brand yeah. recognition. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because he was actually, it was like a throwaway line. Yeah. Right? Because people were asking him a question at the time about Microsoft and then like, oh, what are you going to do about Microsoft? And if Microsoft builds their own browser. Yeah. And then he tossed it out there and that was like the, their last line that mm-hmm. he said before he got on the plane to leave. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. So anyway, so I took that and I, I sort of applied it and flushed it out. So the basic thesis is that business cycles... Uh, I mean, first of all, just the cycle of the business, right? You yeah. have like a long-term debt cycle, your short-term debt cycles, okay. economics, all that stuff, right? Yeah. But essentially, technology, what it does is it enables cycles of what we're going to call bundling versus unbundling, and that either unlocks large economic value or is value destructive, right? And we'll do two sides of the same coin. Yeah. So, yes. yeah. so okay. I'll give you, so let me, let me walk you through an okay. example, right? So let's take uh, 1800s US, right? Okay. So we'll go back in history a little bit. So we, we've gone through several cycles of this already, of in course. America at least, right? Industrialization and whatnot. American, yeah. if you can't tell, right? So yeah, we're both, yeah, we're both American. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I apologize if the references are a little bit ethnocentric, but yeah. whatever, right? Yeah. Um, so in the 1800s, uh, the US built a lot of transportation networks. So like trains, waterways, Correct. Uh, all that stuff, right? And there was a great unbundling that happened there, which is essentially you took the location of production and uncoupled that from the location of consumption. Okay. So avocados in Wisconsin, right? Like okay. no longer could you only consume just the things that okay. were produced within like a 50 or a, 30 uh, square mile radius of agricultural lived. unbundling. Agriculture is the pro- is the predominant example, but it theoretically yeah. applies to everything, right? Yeah. Like well, any well, any, okay. any goods and service. Yeah. Like like let's say you wanted um, a new jacket. Yeah. Right. Like, unless you were like very 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 wealthy or very privileged, right? Yeah. You're generally not going to you want to go to, like, to a local, tailor. Yeah, local tailor. Yeah. Like a local service provider of some sort, right? Okay. So there was a great economic unbundling, right? Because you you now differentiate it. You've managed to delineate your place of production yeah. from your place of consumption. So this is the, driven by the industrialization, essentially, of roads, America. Transportation. So the, te- transportation, the driving yeah. technology, yeah. So technology okay. is the driving undercurrent underneath all this, right? So okay. roads, yeah, trains. Fair, fair enough. Yeah. yeah, trains, right? Yeah. And so that goes on for however many years. And then what eventually leads to is uh, companies begin to understood that the most economically efficient way to compete or to create value is vertical integration. Right? Okay. Well, and so that was, yeah. that was a great bundling. So we went so, from, uh, bundled production consumption yeah. to unbundling or back to bundled okay. again. So right? give us the, the hard example for the audience to visualize. So like the Ford Motor Company yeah. in the 1900s is like the best example of this, right? So for a long time, Ford owned the, like the steel ore, the mines. Okay. They owned the processing plants. They owned okay. the production plants. So they, they, uh, vertically integrated the supply chain. The, everything. The supply chain. They own as much as they can for the end product. Correct. Which I guess, uh, at scale allows for a lot of, uh, economies of scale power. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Efficiency. Yeah. yeah. Efficiency. Yeah. Efficiency. And, yeah. Correct. Exactly. Right. Uh, I mean, they even, even went so far as Ford were like, this is really interesting. If you look at Silicon Valley today, um, they were like the originators of like this nanny company idea for its employees. Right. Uh, nanny idea being. So you know how in like Silicon Valley in, in Western tech companies, right? Uh, the perks, ah, yes, most tech correct, employees, the, you know, yeah. I want to have catered well, lunch, dry cleaning, 
you know, so you're looking at like yeah. your, your employer as a caregiver. They're taking care of like both yeah. your um, professional needs as well as your personal needs. This is the, the idea of um, a company man. Correct. Right? Correct. Which, which is interesting. Like the TV show I was watching, I was telling you about the Patriot, right? Uh, ah. Nick Millen, Wisconsin, right? Uh, yeah. What's a McMillan man? Uh, what's a company man, essentially? Like you're, you're this uh, guy who belongs to the company. You worked there your whole life. Correct. They take care of everything, right? Correct. Like, that kind of concept. Yeah. Which, um, yeah, that, that's completely evolved. And this is the whole rise of, um, management theory, even, yep. right? And all, all this t- ties along with, I guess, this, uh, these kind of vertical companies. And yeah, I guess you're right. You're saying it's not like too much of a new idea, right? Exactly. Well, I mean, that's, yeah. that's my entire premise, right? Yeah. Is everything here is cyclical. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, so Ford, they took this to the extreme. They built like entire towns and villages for their factory workers. So you, like outside of the Ford plant in mm-hmm. Detroit, you would have like a, like a whole. Yeah city yeah and this is all ford employees and yeah. they have like their housing the commissaries their whatever you know yeah. was taken care of yeah right um and so then we had that vertical integrated approach for a long time right through yeah. the 1900s uh but obviously there's, there's certain weaknesses inherent in the system right yeah essentially because you optimize for production and supply chain you uh unoptimize for consumer experience and satisfaction yeah. it's a shitty it's, it's a bad experience right mm. it's a famous quote you can have any color you want as yeah. long as it's black okay yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right yeah and so so then we go through the cycle and then what happens in like certainly like the 1960s and 1970s probably right is advances in information technology basically uh, allow for the decoupling of it's another optimization again where you're decoupling the means of supply from like one vertically integrated entity globalization is essentially what we're talking about. We're talking about yeah. offshoring, like, okay. right? Yeah. So now, as a, like I'm Ford, okay, I don't want to make my tires, right? I don't want to own steel mills. I'm gonna just do okay. what yeah. I focus on, which is uh, creating the cars, and I'm gonna offshore like my mine and everything, you know. Well, essentially, you're talking about this capital formation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Correct. So essentially, we've uh, industrialization is a form of cap, cap, you know, capital formation where you these kind of big vertically into the essentially the reason why you have the Gilded Age, uh, the Rockefellers yep. and the tycoons, correct. All these kind of things. Uh, that wealth starts to unbundle is what you're saying in the next correct. cycle, driven by technology. Yeah. Driven, okay. 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 Driven by communication technology. technology. Yeah. Right. And so then, so we now we've unbundled again. Yeah. Right. And we've diffused. Uh, but then what happens? Well, let's, let's, let's look at there more. Uh, what sure. ta- what time period are we at now? We're we're talking like somewhere between like the cycle of like say I mean I don't remember exactly when globalization officially starts, but I think it's like 1970s or so. Okay. Right? Okay. And we're at the point okay. now where we're kind of questioning and this this fundamental assumption. Well, again, right? essentially, right? So yeah. we've gone through a multi decade process where we've transferred huge amounts of wealth to probably China's the biggest one to say, China. which is uh, tied to this idea of te- technologically driven decoupling. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, unbundling, I guess yes. you could say. Correct. Uh, that we're you know you it's almost like an arbitrage. It is an arbitrage. It's an arbitrage. That's right? It's labor arbitrage. Yeah. That's exactly what yeah. it is. Labor, which is yeah, it was labor arbitrage, and then. Um, China now has accumulated all that wealth. Correct. That wealth is going back into the world, right? Correct. Like they, they're, but the way they're manifesting it, and this is like the Peter, View, Peter Thiel framework is, yeah. um, indefinite pessimism. They're, they're always trying to copy ideas and catch up because they don't have enough, right? Um, so they, they're, they're trying to, you know, I don't know, they captured that wealth and they, they spread it out in that, in that kind of manner where they, they need to, uh, still, still, I don't know, develop the economy in such a way. I think we're on a transition point though, where, it might be people need to start shifting back to what Peter Thiel says, uh, definite optimism mm, where you, yeah. you, you, you think of how the future should be. Then you go build it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So essentially that's the, the decoupling, I guess, with, with China and what we're seeing today. Right. Well, I actually had it. So th- that, that's a good, that's an interesting point. Let's, let's, let me finish my, okay, sure, 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 point, yeah. And then I think we'll go back to that. One, okay. Right? Cause I think we we're, we're close. We're close mm-hmm. Right. So we had, uh, the decoupling and then, so it's specialization of companies, right? So yes, correct. you go from vertical to horizontal. So you get something like a GE, which is in like, you know, it's GE health, GE appliances, they were in TV. Right. So okay. unrelated. Yeah. You know, but the horizontal, right? Mm-hmm. But the problem with that is then you come into this like, uh, landscape of gatekeepers where basically your distribution, your production, your distribution and your consumption are now decoupled, which results in a subpar okay. customer experience, right? Have you ever done any shopping well, that, in well, the that, US? That follows what, like, tr- that follows international trade, trade theory, mm-hmm. uh, globalization, essentially what you're saying. Yeah. Globalization. Like, yeah. Like yeah. It's a specialization, specialization globalization. and you essentially, I mean, in theory, it's more efficient. Well, here's the thing. This is, this is, right. this, is this is my point. And this is where we finish it. And okay. this brings back to the current day. So we had that. That was like the nineties. Yeah. Right. Global, like that nineties was the heyday of globalization, early to early aughts yeah. to a certain extent. Right. Yeah. 
And then uh, essentially what happened is uh, everyone realized that for a variety of reasons that there is this, this model's problematic to, to a large extent, right? Well, I mean, it's tested with the recent shocks that we've been having in the past decade. Right? Even before that. F- financial, yeah. well, I guess, really? Yeah. What, I mean, what, think, yeah, think, okay. about, think about a DTC brand. A DTC brand. A direct-to-consumer direct consumer. Direct yeah. consumer brand, right? So to use the car example, right? Again, sorry for the US-centric uh, analogy, but like buying a car in America in the 90s was awful. Right. You have to go to like a dealer. You have mm-hmm. to negotiate with like some, you know, car sales guy who may or may not give you proper information. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was yeah, an awful correct. experience. Awful, awful experience. Right. And that's because Ford didn't care. Ford didn't own the dealerships. They just yeah. sold the cars to the dealership. Yeah. And ultimately, the dealership. They solved the distribution for the cars. Exactly. Yeah. Solved distribution for cars. But then the, the natural end point is that it's like, like a Tesla. Tesla has taken that and reintegrated everything again. Right. So now one company owns everything. Well, that's right? an interesting story. How, how did Tesla get past the lobby? I think they took so, direct. So I think and Tesla they, is like an interesting point because I think they had to, right? Because they're, everything they did was so new that if yeah. they didn't do it themselves, yeah, yeah, no one yeah, was going to yeah. do it for them. That's a good so point. So it's necessity. Yeah. yeah. So I think Tesla is necessity. But the point, so Tesla is an example, right? But the point is like we're back on this trend of rebundling. Yeah, okay, yeah, correct. Like, yeah, yeah, D, yeah, yeah, like yeah. DT, I'm using these as an example. And so of course, you know, it, different, industries uh, and different uh, economies are in different stages. And so my thesis is to really, truly do well financially, you have to be able to identify where we are in the respective cycle Fair for enough. a specific industry yeah. and understand how to optimize that, yeah. right? So as that relates to media, which is sort of like where I operate in to a certain extent e-commerce, Correct. right? Yeah. So let me use newspapers, right? So I, yeah. as an example. So well, I'll keep this shorter. So newspapers for a long time, uh, was um, bundled by location again, right? You consume the local news, right? Bundled also by the physicality of how much paper you would hold and read. Also that, yeah, yeah. yes, real estate, yes, yeah. correct media. Yeah. Um, and then the telegraph was invented, and theoretically, you could now print news from anywhere in the world because True. it's easy to transmit information. Yeah, correct. And then the method of control became distribution, right? Yeah. So what a, news, a traditional newspaper agency or company did was the combined distribution, production editorial and advertising into a bundle. Yes, and correct. that was your business model. Yes. And that's the business model that Google and Facebook destroyed. Yeah. Right? They took that, correct. they unbump, yeah. they took distribution costs. So all the distribution yeah. and investment that the traditional media companies had invested in was now worthless essentially, right? Because anyone yeah. can go on the internet and Google whatever. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Right? Uh, so they unbundled that. They unbundled the distribution uh, of the content. The information age. The information age. Yeah. Correct. Correct. The growth of the internet. The growth of the internet. In the 90s and beyond. Yeah. That was a great unbundling of the 90s and the early aughts, yes, right? correct. But now what we're seeing again, we're seeing the inverse of that. So we're going back on the other way of that cycle where things are rebundling again, right? So like take like entertainment companies, like Netflix or Spotify is a great example, well, right? They've taken this information or this content and now they're recreating these bundles for consumers. To, to a degree, right? It's, I, I think we're not fully there in the cycle. I, still, I think we're still going through a phase where you're going to see these kind of um, vertical pieces in the media industry or, or other things mm-hmm. in this technology cycle that we're talking yeah. about, right? Uh, we still haven't seen the bun. Like no one's giving me an, like I, I literally subscribe to a four or five different sure. TV subscriptions. Sure. No one's giving me a bundle of that or even the sub sub of those, like within those five platforms, I only want these shows, Specific, yes. right? So like, we're still not even at the point where, um, it's going to be further bundling, which, which do you think it's going to head there or? I think so. That's where we're headed, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that this is like, yeah. uh, it's not like there's no end point or yeah. I'm not saying this is the end point, right? But that's like the large macro direction that I see. I said, I mean, it's really interesting that you talk about that because did you see just like, I think yesterday, Netflix announced they were getting into gaming. I did not know that. Okay. They were, they're developing first, their and, own first party uh, games. Also Valve yesterday or this morning, I guess, in released Asia. a handheld. Yeah, it's a handheld. They, they yeah. call it, a, which ironic, they call it PC. It's literally just a handheld console that's bigger, right? That's, which, yeah, that's, which a, I, I that's guess, 100% what it is. Which, well, if you think about what we're talking about in that, in that context, which technology is driving what? It's the, it's internet and processing speed. Processing speed, right? But it's, uh, for for them, it's 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 no di- like the console. It's literally no different as a computer. There's a blurred line now. The processing power is so powerful that Correct. like like there's this kind of separation of category back in the '90s for gaming. Like yeah. you have console and PC. Yeah. But now like your phone could be as powerful as the games you would probably want to play currently. Uh, That's an interesting point. Theoretically, so so the gaming industry 
and this is like i mean this, this is one why i like the topic yeah because it's so nuanced like any of yeah. these specific stuff like music yeah. movies streaming gaming yeah. they're all such interesting and nuanced uh businesses yeah right so gaming in particular is actually one of the most interesting ones of them all yeah uh, one because i play games so yeah, that's like, personal interest right yeah, yeah. um but two it, it, it's I find the entire thing incredibly fascinating because this is the one industry where you have an artificial, not artificial, but like an external constraint built into it, which is basically the entire landscape resets every seven years. Mm. A new, a new generation of consoles. Okay. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Technolog- you technological shifts or technological innovation drives new technologies or new hardware capabilities yeah. traditionally, right? Traditionally it was hardware driven. Yeah. And then every seven years you, you start over again. So it doesn't matter if Nintendo was a market leader through gen one through gen two, PlayStation yeah. came along, knocked them off their throne yeah. for a long time, right? And the Xbox is now, and they're yeah. all competing in these different, uh, you know, ways. And so to your point, about the hardware question and accessibility and, and right. So this is great graph, uh, out there. I, I'll send it to you later. Basically shows the adjustable market size based off each generation, each innovation and how much of a market is accessible yeah. based on certain, uh, adoption of new technology, right? So gaming traditionally was arcade driven. Yes, correct. You go to arcade, you know, whatever. Right. And that was like very small. So yeah, uh, it, you, people can't see it because we're talking, but it's like, it's very narrow little gap yeah right and then consoles came along and so consoles took that and increased it's like this yeah right? so, so that was like it the took big, a bigger chunk bigger, yeah. bigger chunk right and then uh computers pc gaming became more widely adopted correct and, and that increased it again yeah right and then finally we have mobile yeah so mobile is now like 46 percent or 47 percent. i can't remember the exact stat of all gaming but those are also very distinct customers right because those first three groups yeah. are typically more what you call like a hardcore triple a gamer right yeah where the mobile what mobile actually unlocked isn't it didn't take hardcore gamers so much to mobile as it took people that wouldn't traditionally play games yeah. and made them gamers and that Correct. was a big unlock of mobile well there's also i mean it put more gamers into one area because there's so many types of gamers from like casual gamers, board gamers. Yes. Accessibility. And, yeah, exactly. Made it accessible. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Because yeah. you didn't need to buy yeah. a specialized or dedicated machine Correct. to do it. Yes. Right? Everyone, has yeah, yeah. Everyone has a phone. Yeah. You just open up and play Candy Crush or yeah. whatever the hell you want to play, right? So let's put the, this gaming context in, put, let's put, let's put this gaming idea in the context of your framework of technologic driven bundling on bundling. Yeah. So this is a really interesting question, right? So gaming has traditionally been a very fragmented and diffused landscape. It's, it's confusing. Like, yeah. because what you do, you, ha- you have your hardware makers. Yeah. Right. Which are like people that make like the Xbox, the yeah. PlayStation, the Nintendos, right? Uh, you have your developers, which are the people that are actually like, uh, creating. So they're yeah. the one, they're the artists, the coders. Yeah. They're actually creating the games. You have your publishers, right? Yeah. Which are the people that are finance and market. Yeah. So those are like your, um, uh, your blizzards or yeah. your EAs or yeah. whatever. And there's a lot of overlap between these three things. Of course. So your mm-hmm. hardware makers sometimes own development studios, which sometimes own publishing arms. And then, so, so this, yeah. it's a very blurred line, right? Yeah. And then at the end, you also have like sort of like digital only platforms that act as distribution mechanisms. So like Steam. Correct. Or like an Epic Game Store. Which but is again, also changing now. Which is also changing because yeah. Epic Game, because they're, they're getting, it, yeah. they're all interlinked. But that's what I'm saying. This is okay, like they're rebundling. Okay. Of see what that, you mean. Right. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, like yeah. before, and again, it's a, you know, there's obviously always going to be caveats to it, right? So Nintendo has always had like a very strict strategy yeah. of integrating their hardware with their software. Yeah. Right. They were very, they were always the most tightly held of the groups, right? Yeah. But PlayStation and Xbox started off as a diffused system. They were hardware yeah. manufacturers. They licensed or they brought on, they were platform builders, yeah. right? Their platform was a physical platform and then they got people to sell and create content for their platforms. But now what you see is like Xbox spent like, 14 billion dollars mm. to acquire Bethesda earlier this year. Oh, so I didn't Bethesda, know that. yeah, Bethesda okay. is wow. a maker of like Fallout, like a lot of AAA, a lot of games. Here. Correct, yeah. correct, correct. And also on layer on top of that in Microsoft specific case, right? They also have their cloud business. So mm. that's sort of the integration. Okay, yeah, taking, that makes sense. Yeah, right. I so they're taking, they're taking gaming platforms, they're bundling taking, it to, they're taking IP, yes, okay. they're taking distribution, they're taking infrastructure and they're putting it together into one bundle. Mm. And that's where, and, Again, to bring it back to what I was talking about, the great bundling, unbundling, and where yeah, you want to okay. be. I that. see, I see. Yeah. So let, let, what about this thesis that gaming has been a huge driver in the technological advances then? 
Okay. Yeah. Right. Because like I, I recently started to get back into PC building and all these kind of things, and yeah. what what I'm realizing these the, the cycles are getting faster. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, things are outpacing more uh, across the board from not not just from the hardware perspective, even like an AI. Like it's just things are just getting created faster. But a huge part of that, like the capital formation part, right, is these gamers giving money to have more of these experiences. Right. And the reason why, like, the top companies, like, uh, used to be Intel, but now what's like more of a, um, was AMD, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So they, yeah, they're, AMD. they're driving it because they can sell these things, like, they sell all these products, get the money, but it, it pushes the technology further. Mm-hmm. And it's gaming, to me, it's like gaming driven. That technology can then diffuse to all the other aspects of the world. Like, think about, like, where, where AR and, and VR is heading. It's because of this gaming is being, is, is push, pushing the limits. They're, they're getting the money to make those investments now. Once that technology gets to a higher point, once you know there's five G, more bandwidth, there's mm-hmm. more availability for bundling or unbundling. Mm-hmm. I feel like uh, it's it's it, it can unlock a whole different world of how we interact with all the media that we're seeing today. Yeah, correct. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think I think the graphical component of it is certainly one big aspect. The, just the yeah. Uh, raw compute. Yeah, raw. Yeah, raw the compute. Raw, the yeah. raw compute yeah. necessary to to create these experiences. Because right? put, I mean, put it in any other context, who's going to risk capital? Besides, you know, because you know gamers are going to buy if you, if you, if you hit a certain thing that they want. Well, okay, so this is, this is right. where I, I like media, right? Yeah. Or me, like a musical point. Yeah, media. So, th- th- so this is, so you always have to, I always think about this in the context of media. And media is in many ways the most valuable of all commodities. Yeah. Because it only, it competes for the one thing that you can't make more of, which is time. Yeah. You have finite time. Correct. Right. So, so I think a lot of what's, what you see is people are trying to understand that. Yeah. Right. Like that, Attention and a captive audience is has knock. So there's obviously value in yeah. that in terms of like the traditional models, advertising. You sell Correct. ad space. You can't have a captive audience. You sell your audience to Procter and Gamble. Yeah, or whatever. Right. But then again, back to this question: bundling, unbundling. Right. So now people are like, well, why would I even bother selling my captive audience to a third party? I can just sell my own product and capture more of that value. Well, that's that's uh, not bundling, then, is it? It is bundling. So that's what I'm saying. We're back into this. Uh, we're like so in terms of media. What are we bundling? We're, media, we're bundling. Going again. direct is bundling, but it creates more so, independent ecosystems. So this is and this is this is the key. The key is the definition of what we're bundling. Okay. Oh, right? fair, fair enough. So fair you enough. Have to okay. be, you have to be a bit. It's, it's like loop. what is a monopoly and not right? exactly. Yeah. 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 So okay. like what is being bundled? Correct. Right. So if you think yeah. about bundling as like oh I buy ESPN and I get Discovery Channel as an add-on. Okay. That, that, that that's not happening. We're bundling Just technologies. Technologies. Yeah. 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 I mean that is also happening to a certain extent. Okay. okay. Netflix, Spotify. See, these are all bundles, right? Yeah. But also like we're talking about the bundling of technology, the bundling of supply chain, or, like different. Pro- components of the value chain in, in media the bundling of the whole process of is the whole thing yeah in media what you see now it's, is you're seeing bundling all along the value chain from the very top to the bottom interesting right? okay and that's sort of like the space that we operate in or the mm. space like that well, i operate in i also operate podcasts right yeah well, there Take, you go, taking man. this direct right so i, I am more, more interested in media and see how how that could unfold well so that's an interesting point too yeah right because this one i took i stole from ben thompson yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right so, this, this of course. so he you know the the smile curve Right. No, I don't know. Okay. I, I haven't subscribed to Ben. I, I do read his articles, but I, I need to okay. go deeper. Uh, I'll, I'll explain it in, in brief. So, so the smile curve was originally uh, uh, came from like a Taiwanese chip manufacturer CEO. I think it was mm. Acer, right? Okay. And so basically, again, you know, audio format, whatever, right? You think about a, like a, a quadrant, or you now think about like supply chain is your on bottom. The, on the x-axis? Yeah, on the x-axis. Okay. You think about value capture on, on your y-axis. y-axis and you have okay. A, and then the smile curve. I see. Right? Okay. Okay. So that's smile. Upside down. Yeah. So on one hand, on your lo- top left quadrant, yep. so higher up the supply chain, but also captures a lot of value, are the people who actually design the chips, mm. right? Yeah. And then on the opposite end of that, on the top right corner, in terms of value capture, is the marketing and, distrib- and branding of those yes. chips yep. or whatever, right? And then in the middle, where the lowest economic value is, is um, ma- uh, fabrication. Yeah. The people that put together chips, no one really cares about you, Yeah. right? And so like great example is like, just look at Apple. Mm. Right. Apple has huge market cap. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. But then the people that actually make the phones, Foxconn, obviously a big company, like, yeah. very, but in terms of like, just sort of like, like how the market treats it, not that great. Right. Yeah. And so when you apply that to media context, right. So again, same you smile curve, right. Yeah. On the left hand side, you have IP owners and content creators. So that's mm. you. Yes. Correct. Right? Yes. And on the right hand side, you have the aggregators or what Ben calls the aggregators, yeah. which is like the Facebooks, Googles, uh, to a certain extent, Netflix, Spotify's of the world. Yeah. And then the people that are losing out yeah. are the traditional publishers. Yes. Right. And so that's space. Uh, so to take this whole thing and it's an analogy. So that's the space I play in. 
is I am on the top mm. left corner okay. of that from a content perspective, right? So I'm interested in owning, I, we, our business is interested in owning uh, proprietary and valuable IP. We don't want to be in the business of distribution and aggregation because one, that's, we don't have the background for it. I'm not a pro, I'm like, you know, that's not something that I, I want so to do. So Red Ocean at this point too. Yeah. It's, it's also they, very, They've had big moats for many years. Huge moats. It's also yeah. very, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's gotten progressively more difficult. That's yeah. awesome. I mean, it's still possible. Like TikTok is a well, great example, right? Well, the, the way, the way it's possible is the way Disney did it. They, they, they're on that top left quadrant where they, they own the IP. And I, I was listening to a very good podcast, yeah. uh, on Bob Iger. Uh, Iger. Yeah. Yeah. Iger. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Iger, yeah. 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 And he was, he was explaining how, uh, when he took over. So Mike, Michael Eisner retired. Yep. Asked, Bob was a long shot of getting the job. And then the first thing he fixed was um, that Disney animation was just dying when, when he inherited it. So that's he, a super interesting question. That's he, he had to go yeah. to Steve Jobs and convince Steve to, to sell, sell Pixar because he knew like, and that was a huge red, like you're a new CEO, you were promoted internally and you, you were like probably like this, you know, hundredth in line to, to, to this global, you know, giant machine. And then his first ask is, you know, buying Pixar for seven, eight billion dollars or something. Right. And then of course he had to convince the board, he had to convince Steve Jobs. Yeah. And, but like, Without that play, like if you're not on the top right-hand quadrant of not owning that, and I think that's maybe one of the, the clear insights. I mean, I don't know if you knew that that's going to turn into the the bundling of technology and distribution later on, but but like that that I think that's why I do like media and why I like this podcast because yeah. like you are owning the IP, you can go to you, you could choose how you want to, of course, distribute it direct Correct. or whatever. But yeah. I think the point is uh, being a creator. Right? Exactly, you own yeah. the IP, and that's it, we're yeah. on the same page. Yeah, right? we do it on, on different level and different course methods, right? Yeah, but it's essentially the same. Yeah, and that's actually a really interesting point, specifically these are Bob Iger and the yeah. um, Disney the Plus. Pixar. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's let's go back. Yeah, history, history. yeah, yeah. back to what you're saying, the acquisition of Pixar. So, uh, in management theory, Clay Christensen wrote like basically the law of attractive or. Yeah, the law of attractive profits, basically why big companies don't innovate. Yeah. Right. And this is actually what happened to Disney to a T, mm. right? So when the, when yeah, was yeah. first created, when, when the first, people forget about this now because like, well, people, humans have short time of course, memories yeah. and all that stuff, right? But like 10, 15 years ago, Disney as like a studio and as like a creative, um, uh, organization, was really struggling because what yes. they had done is they did, they did a great job when they first started in the 1920s up until they created like produced amazing IP, super innovative, right? In, in the context of your your framework, your your thesis of, of, of looking at the media, what the Disney went through, what they were bundling, unbundling, what technology so were they doing? They were, they unbundled t- t- TV was probably the content. Part of it. They unbundled content? their content. content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They unbundled their content. And yeah. This was their key mistake. And they diffused it, right? So mm. what they did is he had this amazing IP. They had some, they had, Disney has the best IP. They've always had the best IP, arguably. Yes, and they know how to do it in the right way. Like tell it in not the right always. way. This is this is the truth. Yeah, not, not always. Not always. Yeah. So there was That's this period. In, there was this point. period in time where between like nineteen ninety something up until like the early aughts, where they made a ton of crappy direct to TV sequels. Right. Mm. So that's like your Lion King three, your mm. Lion King's four, Ariel's Little Mermaid five. If you take that, that to present day, that's exactly what's happening in Hollywood. Yeah. Exactly. Media. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So they, yeah. They, they've kind of what, what is it? They lost their soul. They and lost they, their soul. They became, they became yeah. asset managers. Right. Which is also why, again, I do like media because I feel like there's a space to kind of play where you could somewhere along the chain, Correct. whether you're writing the screenplays or building a platform for screenplays or for something like this. You could be a part of this creation process. Exactly. Yeah. Where they're, where they're, you know, where they're sleeping, you take their, their lunch. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And that's, and so, yeah. So they basically went through this period, like a, a creative drought. Yeah. Where basically you became a factory. And yeah. People didn't want to work at Disney because, like, why would I want to just, yeah, make Toy Story? Well, I get Toy Story's not a good yeah. example. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. And, and the, the, the acquisition of Pixar was in many ways, and the way I think about it, yeah. was to address this problem. Yes. Was to yeah. create. To solve the creative trial problem. It wasn't as clear back then. It wasn't as, it was, of wasn't as clear back then. Of yeah. course. And yes, no, you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. We, everyone has, like, the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. Of like, course. Oh, obviously you would do yeah, that. Yeah, like, yeah. why wouldn't you do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyone could have told you that. Dude, it was super risky back then. It was super then. risky. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, but that's the same. Like, investment in IPs will always bear fruit. Right. Yeah. Like the Pixar acquisition, the Marvel acquisition, the Star Wars acquisition. These are all huge value driving, yeah. uh, deals. And then now Disney in the modern day is, Previously, they were distributing. They had unbundled the distribution. They were leaving the distribution of Disney Channel to the traditional cable bundle. Yeah, right. So correct. 
it would be sold through Comcast or Turner or whatever. Yeah. And you know, they were also licensing their content out to Netflix. Yeah. Right. So again, the law of attractive profits. It's hard to say no to I think Netflix was paying like I don't even know how much, like, like two or three billion dollars a year. Mm. It's free money. Yeah. You yeah. know, that, that was also a big bet for Netflix back then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I mean I would be interested to hear the story more, like, because essentially they came to the vision of they're they're basically disrupting TV. Correct. And, and of course Early Netflix, people just wanted the high quality HBO stuff, but then they kind of went the direction where it's just produced a lot of stuff that people can fill their time with, I guess, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think the bet paid off essentially. It's, I mean, yeah, they went from third party to first party, yeah, right? Yeah. So, and, and that's like, but this is, this is why it's so great. This is why this entire industry is doing this, right? Yeah. And so you think about this, like the natural endpoint is eventually, and this is what, uh, Matthew Ball talks about when we talk about the metaverse, right? Yeah. You yeah. will no longer have, who, who's, who's he again? Just a, so Matthew Ball is like a, he's, a, I find him to be like one of the most insightful writers about uh, media in the yeah. VC scene. I think uh, if everyone wants like, I mean, it's, it's pretty robust yeah. work. Like he puts out like these long 10,000 word <laughs> dissertations really yeah, yeah. about media. But I think if anyone is interested in learning more, uh, just go to his website. It's time cool. well spent. Yeah. Like a, one of the best we can spend your time. Right. Yeah. And so, and that's, I think the natural uh, evolution or apotheosis of where we're going is yeah. it's not going to be a TV company or uh, a movie company. You won't be a movie company. Yeah. You won't be a game company. You won't be a comic book or uh, whatever, a music yeah. company. You will just be an IP entertainment company built around specific IPs. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Cause think about it. I mean, that's what Disney does. Disney yeah. has, yeah, that's correct. what they do with Disney plus. They have Marvel. Like I love, uh, Spider-Man. Right. Yeah. Example. So, you know, I can watch Spider-Man, uh, on Disney plus, uh, I can play Spider-Man games. Mm -hmm. I can go to uh, Disney world and interact with yeah. Spider-Man as like, uh, in the future you could be Spider-Man. You could be Spider-Man with AR. Yeah. yeah that's, yeah. That, that's where we're headed. Yes. Yeah. The ultimate formation is just going to be IP and entertainment as the, that's, yeah, that's what your business will be. Which is a really great framework, which is why I think, you know, so this is this to me leads me to the, the point of, where some people might struggle in this space. Is, and the reason why Hollywood is in where they, the state that they are is because what, how do you capture the creative part? We're like, say, say for you, like when yeah. you were doing Althea, you were doing performance marketing, but you're not going to be the, the brand storytelling guy. Well, that's why I left. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Exactly. But, but that, that's yeah. what is needed to, to push this uh, right. idea of metaverse and media forward, probably. Yeah. And which Strong is why opinion. we're in kind of this lull, right? Yeah. So, how, you know, I guess for your, I mean, if you're an investor, how do you go about looking for, or even if you're a founder, how, how do you start innovating around the creative process? Well, so, so that, this is, this is the thing, right? As an investor, I like to have things that are simple. Yeah. Cause I think simple is the best. Um, as an IP, as a, a procurer or buyer of IP, yeah. uh, the easiest solution to this is just work with the best writers, work with the strongest IP that exists out there, right? Yeah. Like take people that, I mean, you're going to pay a premium on it, right? But your returns on a yeah. successful uh, product yeah. is so outsized that that premium that you pay, inconsequential in the long run. So the, you're leaving a little bit of food on the table then. So put this in the context of VC, right? Uh, there's no seed stage for creatives, right? It's very difficult, yes. Right? I mean, you would... Which means there, there's, a, there's a room to play there then. There's a, there's, there's a room to play. Yeah, and, this, and this, is, this is the friction that exists within this particular market, right? Because like, as an investor, you're, a, you're an asset manager, right? It's a risk. You have to manage risk. That's essentially what we're doing. Okay. Right? And so the position that we've taken is the creative risk, the IP risk, are not risks that I want to take. One, mm. because I'm also intellectually honest with myself, I'm just not qualified to evaluate a lot of that. Why, why not build a platform that can evaluate that for you? You could, if you were so right. inclined. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that, 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 that's the yeah. joy so, of it. These are some of the thoughts that uh, kind of passed my mind when yeah. I engage yeah. in media, right? <laughs> I, I yeah. think, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of room to, to kind of keep innovating in the space. So. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I mean, but and th so this, this is a challenge, right? So you, what you're talking about is a challenge of like, this is a challenge that music, the music industry has had since forever, right? Because think about it, music yeah, is the yeah, original okay, no, you're VC. Right, you're right, you're right. Music you're right, is the original yeah. VC. I'm a music record executive. I go and I find a thousand acts a year, right? I pay these guys for their studio time. Yeah. I get them airtime on the on the radio. I bankroll their tours, whatever, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And of which you'll you'll find us like a thousand, and you'll get like maybe one Taylor Swift, 
yeah. and that one Taylor Swift will obviously cover everyone, Correct. everything else. Yeah, 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 but then yeah, yeah. you blew a ton of money yeah. on the ninety nine yeah, others. Yeah, yeah. So I think the or nine hundred ninety nine, right? So I think the the trick here is like it's about if you were to create such a product or a platform, it's about how to quickly bring something to market without risking a lot of financial resources, right? You want to be really able to really quickly test whether or not your content or IP hypothesis is the right hypothesis. And yeah. then the ones that do work, you obviously double down. And the ones you yeah. don't, you haven't spent that much, just move on and keep cycling through them. I feel we're at a point in time where technology can really contribute to this. Like discovery. So you were talking discovery, about discovery, discovery, aspect, discovery yes. and, and understanding what talent really means. Yeah. Back back then when things are very not connected as much. You know, you are kind of like using this kind of, there's a lot of intuition and gut. Like uh, you know, you you, you yeah. try to scout as much as you can and then you take take some bets, right? And it's then taste. right then you do the MVP. You go to the small little stage, you know, yeah. small audience, then you go to the medium stage and bigger stage, essentially, you know, then then someone becomes you know mainstream. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And then this is a, this is an interesting point, right? Because I've thought about this to a certain extent, and it's like, is there a way to use data yes. to to hedge this, right? And so a lot of people, maybe people know this, but I didn't know this until a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, all pop songs are formulaic. Oh yeah. Well, if you don't know music theory, you've been studying. You don't yeah, know music, yeah, yeah. 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 But I, then you kind of know the, the same incorporation. I know music theory. And, yeah, yeah. Well, I also play the cello for seven years. Okay, but yeah, but it depends if you actually go to the part of actually where you're trying to create like. Yeah, that's true. That's true. The, the, the easiest difference between playing creation. The, the, yeah, the easiest sure. ones, of course, is, is, is pop music. But pop then, music, then but then you realize it's just a reinvention of everything, right? They have yeah. the the YouTube shows where they yeah, have that guy who just basically does this. This remake of every single episode, which all sounds the same, same chord progression, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. But that's a good point. Yeah. That's, a, but it's so here, this, and this is exactly the point that I'm trying to make, right? Yeah. Is pop music has hedged this risk a lot, but basically, or music in general. I yeah. Say, whatever, yeah. Right? Let's not get taught with semantics. Music yeah. has hedged this risk a lot because as we, we just discussed, pop music is a formula, right? Yeah. Correct. Like, uh, Taylor Swift songs are actually designed, which is a funny way to think about something creative but it's designed to be super catchy right yeah, correct. so like, yeah, i believe yeah, yeah. shake it off was written in like slightly faster right mm. it's like four three four and like the hook comes like a full 15 seconds before a typical like a like a benchmark pop song oh interesting I didn't why, know that. and this is also that why sense, I guess. but this, yeah. and this is also why pop music and musical tracks in general have been getting shorter over time mm, I didn't think know about that. it no, but think about it. Think about like oh yeah, you you, you mean like yeah, the length of historically track. yeah yeah, yeah for sure like, for sure like, think yeah. about it like like when Queen was putting out their stuff, so the Queen's like greatest hits, right? Were like six minute, six and a half, depending on what it was. Right? Bohemian Rhapsody is like I don't know what like nine or something. This is your is this your technology driven change? This is your technology driven change. Yeah. Well, look, because, okay, okay, but where, where does this? Okay, let's let's ex Put this on the exponential scale. Where does this lead to? Which it doesn't seem like it's good. Well, this this this, 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 this leads this to problem. dystopian. This like, is this is a problem. This is right? exactly my problem. And so that's what I'm saying. This is the conflict as an investor, right, or as mm. someone that's trying to hedge the risk. Okay, I could theoretically put everything through an algorithm, right? Yeah. Netflix does this. Jeff yeah, Bezos, yeah, yeah. They do this. Jeff do Bezos this. famously said this. Like, look, I know what a good story is. You need like you know, it's Joseph Campbell. Hero of a Thousand Faces. You need to have like, um, you know, scrap, uh, scrappy background. You need to go yeah. through conflict. You need to come back. You need to have like an emotional payoff. Yeah. You need all these different characters, right? Yeah. So directly, yes, you could put this into an algorithm or formula and it would spit you out yeah. like hundreds and hundreds of screenplays yeah. with slight variations and permutations. Correct. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah. But is that good? And is yeah. that actually con? And the problem is, this is also how far do you take this? Yes. Right? Yes. Like, and, the, and yeah. this is the question that I don't have an answer to. Well, I'm I'm in, I'm in strongly in a camp of I, I'm more of an optimist. I don't know if people know they can tell in the podcast, but sure. but but I do believe that you know the there's going to be a human aspect always as needed in this creativity process to tell, which is why I'm not afraid of longer form formats, especially in the Asian region where podcasts are just starting to take off. Why like, you are afraid or not afraid? Not afraid of it. Not afraid. Yeah. Not okay. afraid of it. Yeah. I, I do believe people do find meaner meaning and like people will read novels. People will listen to longer things. People will engage Correct. with things as long as the value and the, the interest is there. Yes. And I think that creating long term value, like there, there's this easy plays, of course. And I think uh, it's shaping a lot of short term behaviors, but Correct. I think you can break out of that cycle. I, I, I think, yeah. you know, I'd, if, if that's what everyone believes, 
that would be the secret. I would say that's the counter bet. Go for the longer, deeper, more meaningful things. That's true. Do right. the zig yeah. while everyone's eggs. Do the counter Correct. of yeah. the market, yeah. right? But I'm addressing the point because you're asking like yeah, true, how true, far true, true, can yeah. technology yeah. take this it, process and what can be oh, uh, yeah, you know, so, automated. Not automated, but you know what I'm saying. Like, But then, okay, then what, what you don't have an answer. You're saying then what, what's the take? Are we really heading towards dystopia or can we have a, a brighter future where there's probably a good balance between them? Well, I think right now we're in a great place in, in the media landscape just because there's just so much money. You know, yeah, and yeah. and you know, which is, sounds kind of reductive. DC as well, and but it's but honestly, tech startups, it, yeah. yeah, there's so much money, and a lot of these people are willing, and that's the beauty of it. For a lot of these people, it's not their core business; they don't actually care, right? Who, like Amazon? Oh, okay, Amazon doesn't care if Amazon Studio makes money, right? They just want to have a captive. Audience. They want you. It's a it's a value well, add. This, this is the ex- it's a value yeah. add. Yeah, uh, this is the extension. Of, extension. Yeah, yeah. It's a value add for Amazon Prime. Okay. So they're willing. So in this current environment, they're willing to take a lot of risks because, to a certain extent, to extent, because also if you look at sort of their roster, they only work with like big name producers, big name celebrities and all that stuff, right? But there's still, I think, a greater appetite to experiment on that side of the business. The inverse is the Hollywood, the traditional Hollywood side, which is what you see is like, Avengers, whatever seven. It's, I, I didn't even know what number they are. Well, like the, four or five, right? You know the the the, the beauty of what what we're kind of seeing with these kind of uh, big e-commerce companies and picking up media is that there's uh, almost um, a separation of there, there's no conflict of interest. Yeah, right? they have a machine that's working. Yeah, exactly. They have a so, cash generating yes. machine. That's what I'm saying. They're so they can to make take those risks. risks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. But the, the flip side is that the traditional Hollywood system does not have that. Benefit, yeah. right? They don't yeah. have the benefit of a two trillion dollar company spinning off Correct. more cash than any business has ever spun yeah. off. In the, in Which, the to, to be fair, uh, making film or even movies or TV shows is a very risky endeavor. It's as well. incredibly risky. I mean, yeah. that's that's a famous joke, right? What, yeah. You know what the best way to make a small fortune in movies is? Yeah. To start with a bigger fortune that you got from somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, correct. Right? Exactly. That's, yeah, yeah. that's exactly what it fair, is. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's a pretty good. Um, uh, th- overall thesis and uh, I think we kind of uh, applied it to different sectors gaming media gaming I mean e-commerce is a super interesting one right because yeah. I'm, I'm actually fr- like I worked in media then I worked in e-commerce and now I'm back into the media side and so and I, I applied my theory to to the internet space yeah so traditionally if you think about it when the internet was first created there was always this delineation between commerce websites and content websites and that's how I always broke it down yeah right so you had your like New York Times your mm-hmm. Yahoo Right on the other flip side, you had like your uh, eBay's or yeah. your uh, Amazon, obviously. Yeah. Right this again, just like thirty years ago. So, so these were very clearly uh, there's separation, right? Yeah. And as the internet industry has developed, what you see is a closer merger convergence between the two sides. So now you have these blurred lines, yeah. right? So Instagram has like Instagram shopping. Yes. Right? Or Instagram checkout. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So traditional content. Now we're getting the commerce side of things, right? Amazon has Amazon Studios. Or if you take this to even further extreme in China, you literally have like the next generation of home shopping, except it's taking place on Taobao and it's live stream yeah. shopping. Well, I, I would argue for because of the way China developed first the, the the you know the the West, they had a lot of technological leaps. Yeah, so user, user user behaviors yeah. are very different, and what kind of emerged is very different. So I, I was doing a deep dive yesterday on on the Chinese e-commerce, and that version just doesn't. Like, there are elements like Instagram shopping, face like there there are elements of this you see in the West, but not on the same level you see how it's being executed and done in China. But that's right? what I'm saying. China is like yeah. the future in this particular aspect. China is the future, right? So you think the West will eventually will, gravitate towards this? Yes. So you're saying Amazon's going to be doing social shopping. In the same way that Chinese do it, not well, not, right. the, not the same way. The same way is a very specific use of language. Okay, right. But yeah. like that trend where you where the lines become increasingly blurred. Oh, okay, okay, the two, okay. I could see right? that. That's I could buy into that. That's one. That's one. I could buy into yeah, that. Correct. Correct. Hmm. Right. And you're right because China didn't have all that legacy infrastructure. They just skipped ahead to like the natural evolution of what okay. you would think. But, right. But this ties into like uh, Oliver Sanger's belief, like ninety uh, percent of the people around the world are the same, and it's only ten percent that are different from culture. So it means like you. That's why he executed the way he executed Correct. globally, because he says everyone will need a pair of sh- you know, pants and shoes and shirt. Correct. Everyone will need this. Correct. So you're saying that China has leapfrogged. So essentially, some version of this, somewhere or another, will be very close of how the rest of the world will. Correct. Probably unbundle or debund. Uh, probably unbundle, right? Well, bundled. Because in China, <laughs> well, in China, it's bundled. The West, the West, one bundle. In, 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 
maybe. Right? Well, well cause, so cause the, the reason is also, also, sorry, sorry. Let me just finish. Yeah, okay, sure, sure. Cause the West is also like, we're going through this whole antitrust thing right now. So that's like a French. China equal- too. But they're not really. Right, let's, let's, okay, okay. Let, let's be honest. Let's, let's, let's be honest. Yeah. They're not really. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's 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 kabuki. That's okay. A, that's a pure dog. We'll, we'll talk about that next week. We'll talk about that next week. We'll talk about that next that's week. That's fucking okay. kabuki, right? Can I swear on this? Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Right. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. So the America, the, the recent like uh, antitrust, it has, it could potentially throw like drive. I think it'll be a road bump. I don't think it'll stop it. Yeah. Right. Because their antitrust efforts are focused on like Amazon private label anyway, which is not what I'm talking about. Mm. Right. So, but, okay. but it's, it's, it's still a management distraction. Yeah. Right. So, you know, obviously you have to deal yeah. with that. Um, sorry, you want to, well, my, my, my point is like, um, the way Western e-commerce developed because they, it's, it's the same, the same reason why today there's no one dominant wallet in Malaysia. Okay. There's a lot of, in, hard to displace in like infrastructure that's just convenient like the wallet is not more than 10 times better than my credit card mm. like like when i go to the cash register it's not like i didn't have a you know a credit card before yep. like china right so yeah, i would yeah. use my wechat but the same thing in the west like they had so like it's this is also what i think about why chinese e-commerce might be so different from western is that the west solves it in a very different way they didn't have the online technology so they had big box retail and they had credit cards Right. Yeah. So, so the way you do group buy in America is I just go to like they, the way it was solved was that the company takes the risk yep. and buys in bulk. Then you get to get a membership. Then you have access to group buy in a very different way, but you just don't call it group buy. Mm. You call it big box retail. Yeah. Right. Costco. Or right. Whatever. Costco, yeah. Sam's Club, all yeah. this kind of stuff. Tesco and some parts of the world, right? Are kind of like that, I guess. Same thing. Yeah. Same yeah. thing. Right. So but I think that's just that in that kind of sense, that has to unbundle if you want to see your version of China, if that's the way forward. Right, because it's 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 an unbundling of that stuff that happened before, which is why it developed differently. So let me let me let me break. Like I'm just trying to understand like what your point is yeah. here, right? Yeah. So what you're essentially saying is, say it again, because I really want to. Because yeah. I think you made a point, but I want yeah. to be clear. My my point is that, so like Western and Chinese e-commerce is very different because yeah. Western had more legacy infrastructure that developed in a different way because technology wasn't there. Okay, I All agree right. with you. Right. Yeah, so far on board. Right. So what happens is that e-commerce in America also looks very different. They have to start in a very specific kind of step of ways. Like I had to do books first, then yeah. CDs. Then finally you can kind of have kind of have like a similar platform app, which Amazon's now going to groceries. And they're kind of looking like a WeChat in a, in a sense, but it's still not fully connected because still because there's a lot of legacy. Yeah, correct. Right. So, yeah. so I guess what I'm saying is that um, if – because your, your point is that the future – Looks very Chinese in terms of how that's developed with the uh, the way e-commerce moves forward, right? In this particular, yeah, yeah. These are the e-commerce, yeah, right. e-commerce. Very specific, yeah. <laughs> specific, but I think it. it but the, the the point is the lines are blurring on both sides, China and the West. I don't think the China, but I don't. I didn't, mm-hmm. so I disagree with you because I don't. How's the Chinese e-commerce ecosystem looking more like the West? No, no. I'm not saying it's not looking like the West. I'm saying both sides have lines blurred. Where yes, right, right? yes, right? right, yeah. We agree with that. Right, right. I agree with that. Yeah. But you're saying that the. Your point is the Chinese way is the way forward. It's the I future. Think it's the template for the future. Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah. So if the West has to follow that, they have to unbundle in order to, in order to do that. No. Unbundle no, further. But why? I don't. This, 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 this. I guess. Okay. This is where you lost me. So okay. I, I'm with you up until this point. Yeah. No, because the Chinese ecosystem is 100 percent bundled. Like Alibaba yeah. owns Tsai now. They own Alipay. They own Alibaba. I mean, they own their. All on the value chain. The only thing they don't own Sorry, is the so, actual okay. products. So your that point are being is sold. like, okay, the West will have to bundle more. Yeah, bundle more. Correct. Have to bundle more. Correct. Correct. Of the old infrastructure legacy to to look similar to the way China does. Correct. Okay. Yes, that's that's my point exactly. Yes. I haven't landed on it for that degree, and I, I have to do more research. But you think about it. Yeah, I'll think about it. That's, I'll think that's about the it. point. Okay, but that's the point. Yeah. It's the point. Okay. Is yeah. You have to think okay. about it, right? Yeah. And the flip side of that is we have perhaps the greatest unbundling the world has ever seen yeah. in the form of cryptocurrency. Yes. Right. You're you're different delineating between a government and money, which has never been done. Yes. Well, I mean, it was done in like hunter gatherer societies, uh, medieval, right? medieval uh, the, the pre pre modern modern history. Yeah, 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 yeah correct. Right? Yeah, and, yeah, the, yeah. and this is the so the great unbundling that's yeah. happening at the same time that the bundling yeah. of media and okay. commerce is the unbundling of of money. Yeah, and that is like a whole. That's a whole other. Yeah, that's a whole. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't know enough about that yeah, to correct. speak intelligently. Yeah. So I'm gonna just you know. Yeah. Not talk about it. I, I will have to think more about the unbundling, bundling, how that's defined. I, th- I think there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot, this, yeah, there's a lot yes, of nuance, correct, right? Correct, so, yeah. so when I, when I think it's a quite an interesting framework, um, either from an entrepreneurial standpoint, if you're trying to build or if you're trying to invest, right? Exactly. Same, same coin, different side, you know, right? Same thing. Yeah. So, correct. But, um, 
I think it's a very, very good discussion. So why don't we move on to who you are, Dave? <laughs> oh, I like it. Okay, up to you. Your show, yeah. man. Tell me, yeah, let's, what let's, do you want to know? Let's talk about. Open let's book. talk about China. Oh, China. Let's talk about the Midwest in America. So you, you mentioned you were born in Qingda. Where is that in China? Uh, northeast coast, uh, about 30 minutes southwest of Seoul and almost directly west of Tokyo. Okay, so very, uh, pretty much the south of China. On no, the north. North. Oh, north. Sorry, north. north. Oh, Korea. yeah, further north. Further north. Korea. Okay, Korea. Yeah. Korea. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's not Dongbei. It's not northwestern, yeah, 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 yeah. northeastern China, but it's, we're, we're getting up there. Do you have any memories? They're vague. You know, I don't, <laughs> I mean, this about me. I don't have, I don't have a great memory. Yeah. In general. I mean, five years old is very hard to remember anything. Yeah. I mean, I remember like bits and pieces of it, right? Like I, we lived with my grandparents. Um, okay. So, so my parents are both doctors. Uh, and but my father ended up doing, he started doing his PhD in Shanghai Medical School, okay. right? And so during that time, my earliest memories were my mom and I living with my, my grandparents, my father's parents. Um, and I have some like vague memories, uh, you know, like life okay. taking me to work on a bicycle. That's okay. Everyone wants to ride a bicycle in China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, playing with my cousins. Uh, and then a lot of it is also like filled out. With the stuff that she tells me. Okay, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And so, so it's hard Actually, to what, what is their version then? What, what, like, what is what is their feeling of? Oh, well, when did they leave? What year? What year was they this? They left. So there's a whole story behind this. And I'll tell yeah. you. They left in like eighty. My dad left in eighty nine. Oh, uh, so they left quite late then. No, we were quite early. Early. That was considered early. In, well, in the grand so in the grand scheme of like waves of immigration from China relative to our cohort i guess we yeah. were quite early okay right because obviously you had like a lot of like in the 1900s right you had like a lot of, a lot of the people the labor class that's uh, yeah the labor yeah, class yeah, like yeah, the coolies yeah, yeah. The, the one going to southeast asia and america yeah the yeah, ones that came yeah, on the, to work on the railroads yes, yes right yes yes uh and then for a long time there was not a lot of immigration from china post yes, world exactly. war ii yeah. up until like the late um well cultural 80s. Revo- cultural, cultural, cultural revolution, revolution cold war yeah now, so we were actually one of the first um families to immigrate from China to the U.S. in '89. The Cultural Revolution was from when to when? Oh, I'm fuzzy on my dates. I want to say '60s up into '70s. And there's a whole okay. I, yeah. I have a lot of stories about that okay. one too, right? So your uh, parents lived through that essentially. Yes. Okay, so they were there for the whole time. There, yes, they were there the whole time, um, and it was very difficult. It was, it, was, it was very difficult. So, so I'm trying to um, just various levels to unpack. So let me just unpack yeah, sure. from where I want to start unpacking. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, of course. So what happened in? For people who aren't, aren't familiar with the Cultural Revolution, essentially what happened was Mao Zedong woke up one day yeah. and decided, hey, you know, all, all intellectuals, bad. Yes. You know, we're going to shut down all the schools. No one's going to go to school. Burn all the Everyone, books. Everyone, burn all the books. Yeah, burn all the books, beat up all the intellectuals. Yep. Uh, and then we're going to send all of our youth to the country to be farmers so they understand what it's like to be a proletariat and a man of the people. Is that how your parents ended up in Qingdao from Shanghai? Or? No, no, they were born in Qingdao. Oh, they were born in Qingdao. Okay, so... so, yeah, okay. so my father and all of my uncles went to the collective farms. Shit. So imagine, imagine. It's like I read this in history. Like, yeah. It's we, wild to you, know. It's like, wild. Yeah. 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 It's, it's crazy is, to think about it. Yeah. So imagine like you're 18 years old in like 1970s <laughs> China. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. You just graduated college and now you have to go to the collective for, for, farm. For being a doctor. For like two years. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. So he had to go for the, no. Well, he was, a, he was training to be a doctor and he had to go to. No, oh, no, it was before. 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 Okay. So his time, he tells, well, he tells the story. It's kind of, it's quite funny, right? Because. The way he tells it is he was in the collective farm. It was like his first month. Yeah. And the one that he wakes up, because you have to wake up like 6 a.m. to like start plowing the fields or whatever. <laughs> right. Dude, it's probably like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. or something. Yeah, probably yeah. 3 a.m. He's probably just like, oh, this coddled American doesn't. <laughs> yeah. just, let, me, let me dumb it down for him. Make, 6 it, make him feel better. Yeah, <laughs> whatever, right? Yeah. Um, and he was like, and then he, he, he said, there was the announcement, the, the PA system came on. And the PA was like, oh, we, we are... Filled with sorrow, we regret to inform you that our beloved chairman, oh, Comrade Mao, wow. has passed. And in his head, he was like, fuck. <laughs> Had I just made it for like a few more months, like I just graduated like a year later, yeah. I wouldn't be in the stupid collective yeah, farm. Yeah, 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 and I yeah. could have just like, whatever, right? Yeah. But he, he, so he went to the collective farm and he ended up staying there for two years. Wow. Like two, three okay. years. Two years, three years collective farm. And then they came back. And what came happened back to Qingdao? Qingdao, okay. yeah. So they call it the Xiaxiang, which literally means goes down to like the rural. Okay. So he came, he came back, and that's when. So after Mao died, obviously was, there was a power struggle between his wife and the yeah. whatever, and uh, the eventually the the moderates or the reformists won 
right? And they reopen up all of the schools again, right? But the tricky part here is basically for 10 to 15 years, however long the Cultural Revolution was for, was for no one was admitted to college. So you have like 15, like 10 years of graduates yeah. all vying for like a very, very limited number of slots, yeah. right? And they both got in. So effectively what that means is they are like the creme de la creme. Yeah, the best of the, of the best. The best of the best. Yeah. The intellectual best, right? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you can make an argument like, oh, people didn't go to school, people <laughs> yeah. didn't care. But, but they also kill all these intellectuals. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest. We're, we're talking about like, a point zero 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 one acceptance rate, okay, something that's of that probably order of the magnitude, yeah, right? It, yeah. it it doesn't matter, yeah. right? Um, and so, and it's it's interesting because like you, d- you didn't get to choose, you didn't get to choose yeah. what they wanted to study. You got oh, assigned by the central government. So my, it worked out for my mom because my mom wanted to be a doctor and she was assigned. Yeah. <laughs> my funny story, of all things, my father wanted to be an English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So it worked out. Yeah, like, it worked out. Worked out that yeah. Went to medical school. Well, and yeah. You know, it all worked out, right? Um. Uh. And so we 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 immigrated in. He immigrated in 1989, yeah. I believe. And this is crazy story that he tells me. I didn't find out about this until I was uh, maybe in my early 20s. I was mm-hmm. having I was home uh, from work one weekend having dinner with him. Yeah. We just talking. He told me the story, and apparently what had happened was. He had uh, applied for his PhD program in the U.S. Yeah, right. So he'd done part of it in China. And he was applying to finish it off in like a, a with the program. And that America. was allowed back then. You yeah, could just you, you could, very specific. Was, okay, yeah, yeah. Because well, because he was probably part of the program, yeah, part of the program, yeah. Yeah. very smart, blah, blah, yeah, blah, right. And he applied and he didn't hear back. Right, yeah. like months had gone by, he didn't hear back, and and essentially he was like left with his choice. He's like, okay, look, I could like try and get in contact with him, or I could just like move on with my life and do something else or yeah. just, you know, stay in China. And the tricky part was like at the time, because everyone's super poor in China and this was when AT&T still had a telco monopoly, <laughs> like calling long distance for like a minute Ooh. from mainland China Ooh. to the US was literally Very like expensive. 10% of his monthly salary. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. crazy. That's, that's crazy. crazy. That's crazy. About that, right? Cause now they're like a text message. I WhatsApp you. It's yeah. Like, correct. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. Yeah. Literally it's nothing. nothing. It's part of your, it's less yeah. than nothing. Yeah. I get yeah. messages. I don't want to read. Yeah. yeah right? Exactly. Like, exactly. I don't care what you say. <laughs> Go away. Yeah. Fuck off. And so, but he's like, I have to find out. I need, if I don't call, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. Yeah. So he calls. And he manages to get through to someone and it's just like, uh, most serendipitous of stories. And they're like, oh, is this, um, Edward? Yeah. His name is Edward. He's like, yeah, yeah, it's Edward. It's like, we've been trying to reach you. You know, like we've been trying to reach you for weeks. We couldn't get a hold of you. They're trying to call. <laughs> trying to, yeah, trying to call you. And actually, to call communist China. if we didn't, yeah, if we, if we didn't hear back from you today, we wow. to give your spot away to someone else. Okay. Do you still want to that's, come? That's fate. That's right? fate, right? Yeah. And, and just so, it's so amazing because like that, I mean, really one phone call. Yeah. Literally one phone call. Changed his whole life. Lives. Yeah. Not just his life, our lives. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. Like every, and everyone, yeah. Like everyone I've ever met. For yeah. better or for worse, right? Yeah, you wouldn't be life here. Has been changed. We wouldn't be <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be somewhere in China. mainland China doing like 996 or <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Who knows, right? Yeah. Um, and then so he said, yeah, I mean, of, of course. Of course I want to come. Right? Yeah. Uh, and then so he moved. Well, why, moved. Why, why of course? I mean, it sounds like if he's like at the top of the... Because the, it's still true. Because at the time, and even today, America... From like an educational mm. academic perspective, yeah. it's still the creme de la creme. Still, still, it's the best. It really is the best. I don't. I think there's a lot of play, arguments. Does it still can, hold now? Even now. Even now. Yeah. Even now. Yeah. You know the top, top programs. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. If you're looking for something very specific in a top field, any how, technical, highly field. likely it's probably going to be covered in the U.S. And you want to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it still has that like the prestige yeah. that's associated with it. So I mean, and, and this was again 1989, so it was like a no-brainer. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Why yeah, wouldn't yeah, I? Yeah, go? correct. Okay, right. Fair enough. Um. So he moved in 89 and we moved like six, six, seven months afterwards in, in 90. And so I do, I don't remember much about China, but I do, I have some very vivid memories of Oklahoma, but, but, which is where we ended up. I don't know if it's so much of a, a no brainer though. Is that what he says? Is that what you feel? Well, at the time, well, that, because I it's think, like, think about it. Like, you're think literally, dude, like your whole context is like something of China, like, it's very weird, especially back then. Think things are more connected now. Information is easier. Yeah. Like people travel much more easier. Yeah. But back then, you're uprooting your whole life, and you know your wife and your child, your family. You're leaving your family behind. Yeah. You don't even know if you're going to come back. Yeah, it was a big risk. It, well, he never did. Yeah, exactly. So he exactly, never went back. Right? <laughs> I don't know. So was it really a no-brainer? I mean, I well, mean, I think it must have been something. Sure, sure. There might be an element of revisionist history. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I will never know. You can. Oh, you you can't ask him. I think it's one of these things where you're 
version becomes reality. Ah, true. Perception yeah, is fair reality. Enough, fair enough. Fair enough. Right. Yeah. My my dad completely American now. He's, there's no way he's ever gonna leave or co- you know go anywhere else. So. Well, that's also a really interesting point because my dad, in his old age, has got gotten more Chinese, and this is from fake news. <laughs> uh, but he's in the Midwest. Okay, so this is super. This is really interesting, right? So he went to medical school in China. So yeah. they, they're still quite close to all their classmates that they went to medical school with, mm-hmm. right? So they have all these WeChat groups. Uh, in America or in, in China? America? Okay, so he's, so in the, he's in the WeChat group with people that are living in China. Okay, yeah, 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 right, 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 yeah, yeah, yes. right. So he's still in so, touch with them. He's in touch. He's still in touch, right? Uh, because you know, as they all got older, and oh dear, they, they, yeah. <laughs> and so then he started like it's, I, I only, also I only found out about like two years because my mom told me is he's been reading all these like disseminated articles and a lot of his oh, propaganda. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then and obviously China's descendants, like, like, oh, China's so great. Yeah. You know, we're, we manifest destiny. We've come into our rightful place in the world. So he's like very patriotic now. Interesting. About, he wasn't before. China, which much less so before. Much less so. Interesting. But my mother does not read any of those things. She stays out of it and she's very American. She's like mm. incredibly pro American. She's like, if she could buy a gun, I think they, they actually did. She can do, buy a gun. They do own guns. I mean, <laughs> she probably has a gun. Yeah. Um, so now this is, it's kind of like, we have like a, like a, like a low key conflict. It's not like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's you know, not really. But they don't talk politics anymore. Yeah. They don't talk politics because like they just can't see eye to eye. And it's so funny. They've been married for like 39, 40 years. They went through the shame, shame, yeah. the same shared experience yeah. of immigrating, uprooting your whole life, raising a child in a foreign country, yeah. adapting and localizing to a foreign country. Very similar professions. Yeah. And now they have like such disparate the power of media, right? Power and media. Culture. Right? Yeah. Culture and media. Fake news. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very interesting. Like my, my mom, she probably wouldn't mind retiring back in Vietnam if she had no support system. Cause she saw his family. Oh, family. Right? Yeah. My, my dad does not want to go back probably at all. But like, honestly, my mom has so well ingratiated into the community and volunteering. Like she's fine where she is too. It's like, it's not like she doesn't need to go back, but like, it's a very common trope, I think, for a lot of um, Asian Americans who immigrated probably l- or is it considered earlier, but like more recently, more recently. Right. Mm, what do you say more recently? You mean like what? Like nineties? Yeah, nine, like something like the nineties and. I would say like you're still within like a pretty old vintage. Is it like okay. the recent immigrants? I would consider it be like the four or die, like all the, you well, know. My parents came in the seventies. Yeah, so you like you, early seventies. Yeah, yeah, they're date. true Americans. You're true Americans. <laughs> you guys came on the boat, right? Uh, no, they. Well, my well, my dad came as a student. My dad. Uh, hopefully he's not listening, but, uh, he, he was pretty bourgeois. <laughs> like, oh. uh, he, he, he has come from a, many generations of doctors. Ah, he okay. grew up with a, a cook, a chauffeur, went to only French school, oh, went fancy. to the sports club. Yeah, very atos, I could have been a prince in say. Vietnam, yeah, probably, very, right? Very, but, but the communist and everything, right? Um, my mom was okay. I don't know. Not, not exactly clear of her, but like, uh, but, but the point is like my dad came as a student, mm-hmm. as a university student, then the war hit. My mom came only one year of the American isolation. Like at the very beginning of it. So, which is, you know, that, that's why I think maybe 70s was like more, mm. like that's why, that's why I feel 90s is like, wow, that's kind of, you know, very recent. Oh, I, so I consider recent the people that moved to the Chinese. Well, it, to be fair, the, the, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. The community, the community is different, the different, different yeah. definitions. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a good so point. We should, yeah. we should, pr- yeah, exactly. Caveat yeah. this, right? I feel like the, anyone that moved like in the 90s, uh, I, I would say like an older vintage, like the new ones are the ones that have moved. Um, like the 20, 30 year olds that moved. Yeah. Like, That's within, a fair point. Since the, aughts, okay. Okay. You know, like, so a fair point is that like, I felt like some of the more recent immigrants have a tendency of wanting to go back in their older age. Mm. Well, my dad actually wants that. So mm. he's like, as he's gotten old, like, has he, that changed or he's, he's grow, grown into it? He's more vocal about it now, I think. And mostly because I think that's like, you know he's 64 now as you get towards the end of your life or in the latter half of your life right you long for these feelings to, of like to be fair home he was family. very old when he left right he was my age oh, sorry. 30s i'm 36 he was definitely younger than me he was younger he was 30s younger. 20s 20s he, he late i want to say early 30s yeah i think it was early 30s yeah. when when we my mom left. left when she was 17 my dad was 18 yeah so maybe a little bit different in that kind of different. respect yeah. yeah also he has a lot of siblings right ah, so, so they're all still back in china they're and, m- mostly yeah. there's a couple okay. like in the u.s but yeah, yeah predominantly in china right and so like i think as like i said towards like the like the latter half of his life right he wants to like recreate those like familial bonds you know the like, thing feeling, is he right? might go back and be very disappointed <laughs> well that's i don't think so 
Uh, speak, speaking of which, you, well, you don't have too many memories of China, but you did go back in 2010 for Gaoping and Groupon, right? Correct. What Correct. was that like experience wise? Was oh like, God. well, also you were very, at the time you were just a Midwestern kid. Like a young guy it's from the Midwest. Five at the time, twenty four, twenty five. And you had, yeah, you had mostly worked in America. <laughs> in your context, right? Was, I mean, this, this is, this is, it's so funny. There's so many stories here. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me for you listeners of your podcast. So we, you've talked about rocket internet before. Yeah, on your I podcast, have. right? And we're all. Rocket. I have to. I mean, unfortunately, most unfortunately, a lot of my network is rocket internet. So. No, I think it's fortunate. I think yeah. honestly, rocket. Yeah, yeah, did a pretty job. I, I think curating. So. Yeah, I do. I think. Yeah. So the way I tell it is, every generation of Rocket expats yeah. was progressively more civilized than the previous batch. Right. I completely agree with you. And I say that in <laughs> reference to myself because yeah. we were the first batch. Yeah, yeah. We were. So you, you guys were honestly Rocket Internet uh, royalty of sorts. I say. Oh geez. Yeah, you, you were like ground zero. Yeah, we were ground like, zero. Gr- like Groupon is ground zero for what Rocket became. I was just very early generation, first generation of the global expansion. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We were, we were the yeah. original ones. You and set we the were, tone for everything, <laughs> which was and, and the tone was ridiculous. Right? Yeah, insane. So, <laughs> so to to for students of history, let's take this ten years ago. Groupon China is Rocket's most successful venture. By successful, I mean least successful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we were the company that spent 60 million US dollars in six months. I thought it was more. Hired, I thought it was 100 million. Something like that. Yeah. Right? Uh, hired 4,500 people yeah. and expanded to like 50 markets. Yeah. Right. And again, you have more, to, I think it was markets were even more, right? No, it was like 50. The, oh, so it's like country, countries, right? In or, China. Oh, no, in China. China. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. okay. Consider each city a market. Yeah. Right. So, which I understand, like, in this day and age, might seem like pedestrian numbers. Yeah. But at the time, that was, like, crazy town. Yeah. It was truly, like, pe- it was unprecedented. People were like, what are you guys doing? Well, the, the histories are very interesting, right? Because I, I feel that, uh, is this, this is before Groupon got involved, right? No, it was. No, no, no. Groupon was involved. Okay. So, Groupon got involved with the, so, that means, that means um, Rocket Internet sold uh, city to- deals. To, to Groupon, Groupon which correct. is uh, Groupon Europe. And Groupon and City Deals, whatever, became Groupon yeah. International, which was run by Oliver somewhere. Okay, so that, that, that's not the point. That, that's why I didn't really, it was clear. So what was interesting was for China, it was Tencent investing with um, Groupon. With Groupon, which was the majority shares. 10% was only Rocket and 10% was this other private equity company. No, it was, it was okay, 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 okay. So yeah, this is, yeah, let's go back. Let's go back. So Galpon, which was what Groupon China was called, Galpon, okay. was a JV between um, Tencent, Groupon, Rocket, and the, the uh, and, and Rock. No, because Rocket was in Groupon at that time. Oh, okay. Oh, because, yeah, okay. So uh, Rocket was, yeah, Groupon. Well, Rocket yes, was I Groupon. S- I see what you yeah, mean. Because they, they were so it was, it was acquired actually, by. Correct. So yeah. it was like 45, 45, 10. So 45 being Groupon, 45 being uh, Tencent, yeah. and then 10% being, I don't remember the name of the company anymore, right? Yeah. And I mean, this is the crazy part about China. Like, so while Tencent has this JV, they also ran three other competing, like, Twango group by companies on their own. They had like Tencent. Tencent. They had like QQ Twan. What, what, yeah, what like, is up with the cannibalism with this? I, I felt that it's, it's just it's, it's a theme just, that happens with Chinese. Darwinian selection. I think it's just Darwinian selection. Yeah. Because even like, okay, I mean, like we're getting off topic, but like even like um, Alibaba, Meituan, like Alibaba had had invested in like early Meituan or something. I forget the exact, but essentially people tend in China, like what I, what I see is a trend, like they will just invest and compete with themselves. I, I really don't understand. Well, there's, two ways, there's, there's two ways to look at this, right? Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little bit reductive, of course. Of course right? yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. performative. So yeah, this yeah, is yeah, performative, yeah. right? When I say start winning selection, I think, you know, from like a business point of view, you can make an argument that you're just hedging your risk. Okay. Right. Yeah, you have expo- way of looking you at because you want to buy exposure to the industry. Yeah. Right. So let, yeah, let's, let's talk about serious competition, right? Yeah. Like if I want to like invest in, uh, tech stocks and I don't know which one to buy, mm. I don't know between like Alphabet, Amazon or Apple, I'll just yeah. buy a basket. And that's what I think these guys are doing. So they're being investors of sorts. Yeah, they uh, buy. Yeah, they buy. Ex- you buy exposure to the industry or to the sector. Uh, that's so. It's along more the philosophy of uh, spray and pray. Uh, that's what get, I, get, that's, that's how I think about it. Okay, yeah, that's how I think about it. I, and look, and, and the more I research into like China, Chinese e-commerce, and like I, I'm really curious to hear your experience because like it's just it sounds insane. It's it kind, insane. It, it sounds like like me competing with Grab and Uber is like a walk in a park compared to what you guys did it's, in China. Okay, so let me tell you sorry. <laughs> let me tell you sorry. Yeah. So we we called. China, the land of the midget king. Yeah. All right. Chinese translation, but whatever. Yeah. So as you know, 
rocket internet, all over somewhere, in my opinion, his true skill is in operations. He's actually kind of a shitty operator. He just fixes problems by throwing money at it. But his true skill was in capitalizing, fundraising. Yeah. He could always outraise everyone else. Therefore, it negates the necessity to actually be a good operator. Well, I think it's fascinating you bring that up. Like, I, okay. Maybe, maybe in a sense that he's not very operatively focused, but he's very detail oriented. He's incredibly detailed. But, but the, the waste that happens in these. Oh, companies, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. I, but I feel like that was a necessary I don't evil know. to, to. No. Mm. No, it's a scale. Cause it, it's yeah. a spectrum. It's a trade off, right? You yeah. go in there and you have a spectrum. You can, you can grow I mean, all companies, right? All businesses. Yeah. You can, if you're, especially if you're venture funded, right? You can grow it responsibly. And like methodically and planned out. Or okay. if you're in okay. a quest for scale, which all rocket companies are or were at the time, you just throw money for pure market, uh, market share. Yeah. And then I think, I mean, that, that has paid off in many ways for it many has. companies and not, not just rocket, right? No, for sure. For sure. I'm, look, this is no, I'm not, this is not a value judgment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah there's yeah, no, yeah, there's yeah, no, yeah. Right? you're saying like, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm literally laying out the facts as I see them. Right? Yeah. And so blitzscaling, right? The term is blitzscaling. Yeah, correct. So Groupon, we were the original blitzscalers. Correct. We were the first Dude. mass deployment of this strategy. On a global scale. On a global on, scale. Yeah, the first, I agree. A, yeah. Yes. And so all these traditional strategy has always been just to raise more money than everyone else and outspend and gain market share. Yes. Right? Which I think is a very clear insight because it was an arbitrage. It's an arbitrage. Because these days, you can't do that you anymore. Can't. And he saw the opportunity and he actually got his cut from it. Right. I don't know if he knew there was a timeline, but he definitely knew that this is a formula that worked, right? Okay, I agree to that statement because you could tell by in terms of the IPO and going back private, like it wasn't very clear that he could do it forever. But, yeah. but uh, I mean, eventually it did become clear. But at the end of the day, he still made like, like when I when I first met Ali, it was like uh, back in 2012, and it was not clear he was going to make anything happen out of this global expansion, sure. right? But within like seven years, less than less than ten years, he somehow became a billionaire, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. So to, to the point, right? So we called China the land of the midget king because this is like, and this is where Ali failed. Yeah. He finally met his match. Mm. Right. The, we had, so, I mean, the headline numbers where they're like, oh, there's like 5,000 competitors in like the group buying the stream. Thousands. Which yeah. is true. Yeah. Yeah, actually yeah. true. Yeah. But there were 10 very well capitalized, very well backed competitors, each of which had raised at least eight digits. And like, we're talking like high eight digits, like 50 to 100 million US dollars oh, in okay. funding. That's pretty amazing because this, we're talking back in 2010. 2010. Yeah. Like that's, so this we were also unheard of, right? It was unheard of. And this is also the originator of the strategy, origination of the strategy in China. But this is like DD or like Kwai D, yeah. the bike sharing companies. They all do this now, right? But at the time, yeah. this was, Novel. Yeah. Right. Well, this, this is novel. And also, like, was this in response because of yes. Rocket's entry? Correct. So it, it, did the locals band it together in the well, sense? band it together in the sense that. In the sense that, like, well, well, cause also the view, like, I was doing some research. The, like, one opinion piece was that a big part of the failure was being too foreign. Right. The two top guys were, uh, Mads and Raphael, correct? Oh, I have stories about them too. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we can <laughs> escape we, that. We both, we both know those. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, yeah. So let's explore these topics, right? Yeah. So let me finish my point. Okay. Sure. 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 So, so yeah. So you, you basically enter these markets into, I mean, we did ridiculous things, right? We would go to our competitor and offer their top salesperson three times their current salary and then fire them like two weeks later just to deprive that company of their top talent. Oh snap! Wait, wait. Okay, how does that work um, from a legal basis? Like, what does it? What does that prevent? So you get them for two weeks, but then we just we just take. We do, so it's it's just like win at all costs, yeah. no mercy, right? And so you ended up having like these crazy dynamics where like you would go and it's a local business. Let's be honest. Like group buying at the time was very much driven by F and B. Yeah, right. That was the main driver of yeah. the purchase of coupons and the growth. Right, especially in China, people love to eat. Right. Yeah. So you would go to like some normal. Not that great, like a very average, like hot pot place, yeah. right? And then, you know, this guy would act like he's the CEO of like Apple, because <laughs> you go in there as a salesperson, and I was in sales at the time, yeah. And he'd be like, "Okay, what are you, what are you, what are you giving me?" I'm like, "Oh, you know, we have a great platform, and mm. blah 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 blah." And we did this too, right? But yeah. he's like, "Okay, well, you know, your competitor is giving me zero percent margin, so they're doing it for free, and they're prepaying me like thirty thousand RMB on top of this." Dude, that's insane. It's insane, and they, it, this was replicated in every single market across all of China, and we just burned money like crazy. Dude, I, 
this is like a version of Rocket I don't even know about. You don't right? even know. Like my, my version is the diluted version of this. <laughs> and, the, and we call it the land of the midget king because even the market leader had less than 10% market share. Yes, correct. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, why yeah. it's a land of the midget king. So, yeah. so every month you would have a new leader, mm. right? And usually that was predicated based on like who had spent the most merchant acquisition marketing to buy some famous hot pot chain to list on your platform. But then once you do that, the next week, every other platform goes to that new merchant and gives them the same deal. So they list on their platform and the whole cycle repeats over again. Yeah. And you can only do this so long Correct. before you run out of money. Well, it's a price war, essentially. It's a price war. So every, everyone's fighting to go to zero. It was less than zero. Well, then, it's okay. Why, why, why did Rocket go to zero and why did he, so, why did yeah. you, like, who, I mean, who emerges from this period? So this is, a, well, okay. So first of all, the market leader changed on a monthly basis. Yeah. There was no, I mean, at the very end, like May 20, Dianping were the ones of course, that yeah. won out, right? Yeah, yeah. So the reason that Rocket failed or Groupon failed is essentially um, bad timing. So Groupon US was IPOing at around the same time. Um, 2000, 2010, 2011, yeah, 2012. Yeah, yeah, yeah correct. Right? Yeah. And obviously when you IPO, if you have your Chinese venture yeah. burning like $80 million every couple of months, it's what not- What is this like the, the Uber problem yeah. and selling off Correct. Southeast Asia, doing the deals with Grab in China, Exactly right? what it was. You exactly. got to, you got to cut the places where it just doesn't, where it's just going to be a burn, right? Yeah. 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 You become a public company. You yeah. can know, you can't, you know, there's no, there's no diluting that, those facts, right? Yeah. And so essentially what happened were, was they, they said, so what happened was like, you know, we had the six month plan expand to 50 markets, hire 4,500 people, yeah. brutal market share fight. And after, at the end of six months, we, we go back to the board and we're like, Hey, you know, so that business plan that we had discussed and agreed upon, <laughs> we've executed it. You know, we are the kings. Yes. But we need more money. You know, give us like a, yeah. another whatever. And this, like, this is to the board of Groupon. Okay. Yeah. And then they were like, yeah, you know, we're IPOing. So you're not getting any more money. You're on your own. Wow. Right. And so then we spent the next eight months firing like 3,500 people. There was a period in my life where I literally just <laughs> flew around the country on a plane firing people. Dude, I remember these stories. Like, uh, the, yeah. you know, you seen the movie like Up in the Air with George Clooney? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was yeah. that guy. I was him. You know, I was like... But, but, but what I heard is that like when you did this, you would have to barricade yourself in the office and people would like, like they would lock you in. Certain people had Certain. to do this because they were assholes and inconsiderate. Mm, so, the story. so it depends how you do it. Okay. It depends how you do it. I mean, you have to be a human being. At yeah. the end of the day, if you treat someone with respect and dignity, yeah, they'll understand. Because you're like, I'm a hired, like I'm also an employee. Yeah, this is not. I'm not. I'm not Ali. I'm not. Yeah, correct. I'm not uh, Andrew Mason. I'm not yeah. Eric Lefowski, whatever his name was, right? So if you treat someone with dignity and, and humility, or I know, agree, because I've done this many that. times for Rocket too. Yeah, and, and, and so I, yeah, so I, agree. I, I always try to approach this process in like. A compassion in a way, uh, you know. You like, have to. I, yeah, I felt yeah. bad. I, I honestly, yeah, of course, felt bad. you have to. Yeah, it was yeah. toll on my psyche. Like it, it, it was really difficult. It was a hard six months going around just firing and people. And you were in the the headquartered office, Beijing, right? I was in Beijing for a while. I was in Qingdao. Okay. And the, the thing to remember is like I was twenty five at the time. Yeah. I was a kid. I didn't know what was happening. Like, or you, you know, but like you don't have the luxury of experience. You don't have yeah. You don't have the, emotion, the, the temperament, the tools, the mindsets, the yeah, mental models, the, the mental yeah, yeah the, the fortitude. Strength, yeah. The fort- yeah, you don't have any of that. You just have to go with it, right? Yeah. And so that particular story that you're referring to, what happened was that person he fired everyone by telling IT to come collect people's laptops, and that's how people were informed. Wow. And that's why they kind of mutinied and locked him in the office. Yeah. So it's all about how you do it, right? Correct. If you, if you go to the office and you're like, Hey, this is the facts of the situation. I'm very sorry. Yeah. You know, I, I understand this is difficult and all that. And you explain it to them. Most people will take it. Okay. Yeah. Right. They won't, they won't, they won't like lynch you, <laughs> you know? Well, here's an interesting point. Cause you, you bring up the fact that they went to the group on board to ask for more money. And this is, this has been Ollie's. If you watch enough of his YouTubes, one of his biggest insights is that he hasn't like held on to value long enough to reap the full value of it. He always sold too early, right? Now, if you if you you know if, say you're I don't know you could do the exercise. If you think if you got more money, do you think he could have been at least somehow invested in one of these big guys who even if it's a minority stake, you know, having a small percentage of, of Meituan today, right? Like I don't know, like uh, yeah, that's a it's a good question. It's a good question. So I wasn't I obviously wasn't privy at the time yeah. to like the inner workings of like what was those conversations, right? But the 
story or the impression that I got is Ollie did actually want to continue. Yeah, okay. He, he wanted to he fight out, more. He wanted to, he was he was outvoted by the rest of mm. the the management team. Yeah. Right. That that that's my understanding of it. That probably takes uh, um a tone of how he decided to run Rocket going forward then. Yeah, correct. Right? Yeah, he took those lessons, yeah. internalized yeah. them and obviously changed the way yeah. that he operated going forward. But yeah. I mean, he was a master of raising, but like, uh, what, what the feedback that I got with talking to people was that he had to raise from very weird places. He wasn't going from like triple A VCs. And so we had to go to like, what, like, you know, sovereign wealth runs like Scandinavia and like all these other I mean, te- the telecoms and Scandinavia, sovereign wealth runs are not a bad place to raise. It's not a bad place. Yeah. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's, let's, let's yeah, be honest, right? But it's not like the, it's a brand, household brand name that everyone knows, right? Well, I mean, I think that's also like a certain, yeah, I agree with you, but I think there's a certain level of like myopia within the VC world itself. Yeah. Right. And I, I think that there's, because let's be honest, like rocket internet companies are not traditional tech companies. Of course not. Yeah. Right? It's not their... Well, you know, it's a very interesting point that you bring up because looking at later YouTube videos of him speaking, like say 2016, 2017, he talks more about product. He talks more about like, oh, now I realize like there's some kind of method that we should be looking at, which is why he acts more of a VC now with founders uh, capital, right? He, he, yeah. he, he, he went... Absolutely. You're right. 100%. Yeah. He went through a period of reinvention. Yeah. Right. But I mean, think about it. Like Groupon, Lazada, Zalora, you know, a, a typical VC business, a true venture tech company has zero or close to zero marginal costs. Yeah. Right. And that's that. And that's why you need VC funding. Correct. You spend a bunch of money up front. It's, it's for growth. It's, right? for growth. it's like, something that works. Well, well, the, I think that one thing though, the one clarity point I think that makes sense with the e-commerce plays was that the, the contribution margins, the, the, the economics makes sense at scale. So if the, there's this kind of like blitz scale burn kind of makes sense for it. Right. Now, now I, it's a matter of the market's ready or not. Yeah. I, I that's, think fashion, that's, that's, fashion was li- like, we were thought we we're going to be the darlings, Laura, right? Yeah. When I was executing that. Uh, but it turns out Lazada had a better product market fit. I still feel it's because timing. They're, they're, well, I think there's just a better, um, Product market fit for for uh, mass market, which is like the countryside. Sure. So, so early on, you see the distribution of orders. For Zalora, it's always the main cities. Yeah. No one in the countryside is buying Zalora. Yeah. Early side, people in the countryside are buying refrigerators. You see, like Zalot, like uh, Lazada was delivering refrigerators on the back of motorbikes to these to these, to these places, it's right? True. You true. know. So, and I felt like that's a better kind of fit, which kind of. With the aggressiveness of of investing and being hardcore and and you know going for dominant market share. With a slightly better product market fit, even though it's not really product oriented, still kind of made sense, you know. Well, so this is yeah, I agree with you. So I, I, I thought I, I thought about this a lot after my time in e-commerce, in both here and, and or in China, China and here, right? Yeah. And I, I think there is like a, it, I, fundamentally, it's a time question. Yeah, and I'll explain, right? So, like if you think about the evolution of e-commerce in any country, it falls template. Right? Yeah. So when you first start, you have these like C to C style. Marketplaces like an eBay, Craigslist. yeah, Craigslist. Whatever. You started with uh, classifies always. Yeah, classified. Always, classified. Yeah. yeah. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. One of the predominant reasons is because like people don't know what it is, they don't know how it operates, and they're taking a bit of a risk when you buy Correct. something, right? Yeah. So the price points are low. Yeah. Right. And so they're like, oh, you know, I spent like 50 ringgit, whatever. I someone rips me off. I'm like upset, yeah. but I'm not gonna like cry yeah. about it, right? And then as the market matures and as your consumer patterns behave matures, you get to like sort of the next step of the business, which is sort of like a more slightly more curated expense, but still like very like night market, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what I would like call like a Lazada or Shopee yeah. or even some of the Chinese ones, right? So it's just like, it's like uh, B2B to C, right? So you have yeah. your merchants on the platform and you sell to customers. Yeah. Right? And so, uh, and then that's, you know, again, now it's a question of like pricing is still important, but now like things like convenience matters. Selection matters, right? They matter more than they did in the first stage. And then the final stage, you have what's essentially kind of like where the US was heading for a while was the brand.coms, right? Where you, Interesting. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's go with this. Right. Yeah. And so, so then, so then you want to start like, like, oh, this brand, it speaks to my ethos or like, I like what their values are. But that's a function also of how much wealth is created for Correct. a big population, which, okay, China can do that. China Southeast that. Asia is still kind of small for that. Yeah. So again, timing. This one. My yeah. Good timing. Okay. Part, yeah. So it's smart timing of the market entry and the evolution, like where you want to play, right? So I think you're correct. I think the Zalora value proposition is like it entered at the time where it was like the at yeah. early stage where it well, should have fit in, or it would no, most logically okay. fit in no, the second it, half, it right? It fit in, but uh, it got to the point where everything we put in was growing the market. 
you never want to be in that position where it's, yeah, it, you're yeah, trying yeah, to, yeah. yeah like yeah, you don't, you, you don't, you don't be the guy. Yeah. That's right. True. So, so what happened was like, we quickly hit that ceiling. The, 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 ca- the customer acquisition cost was insane. Yeah. And we had to cut it, but then you realize your market is not as big anymore. To me, the biggest mistake for Zalora was that they never went offline because that's where the real market was then for Southeast Asia, where you are. Uh, time I, wise, right? I have the same, I have the same, um, diagnosis of Altheo. Yeah. It's, it's, a, you know, I mean, there are a lot of, I could say a lot about that business, right? But essentially yeah. it's the same, right? There was a ceiling to well, how okay. big that business could have been. Before, before, let's, what was Althea? Althea was. So Althea is, um, uh, a Korean beauty e-commerce company yeah. that basically it's a, um, cross-border model where we sell products from Korean suppliers in Korea directly yeah. to consumers in Southeast Asia. And so the, the tricky part here is like, you know, K beauty is traditionally a value product, right? But because of various like distribution agreements, import exports, it's yeah. actually positioned as like sort of like a medium to like mass premium is the term that people use for it. I feel that's early, early version thesis. But like, if you really think about what you guys did for Althea when you were running it, um, it's no different than the Chinese e-commerce play of Feeding China to Southeast Asia, exporting down, right? Except you have a more premium brand in theory. Yeah, it's right. Okay, so that's how the company started. Correct, correct, correct. So that's how the company started. Eventually, we went into private label. Yeah. So we tried to we were trying to become our own brand, right? And um, I think that was the right play ultimately because that's like where value creation is highest because you don't want to just be like a seller yeah. of other people's product because then all the CAC money that you spend is just promoting someone else's brand. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, well, that's what happened with uh, Easy Taxi, I think. Yeah, correct. We we, we built. We were probably the one set to win rideshare in Southeast Asia. We had rocket internet behind us. We spent all the money. Uh, Grab decided to spend more. So about the same time they took over. Market share was what determines everything in yeah. Southeast Asia, right? For raising. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It's, yeah. Growth. Then uh, top, top line. I think that that's a very interesting point for Southeast Asia is that like, if you want to do it big, like people don't realize you need more money than you actually think. You, oh, yes. to, to do something in Southeast Asia. Yes. Correct. Right. You're not going to get far like a half a million to do start an MVP unless, you know, of course, this is very, I mean, there is, there's this nice Silicon Valley story, but you know, if you're trying to do something big within a reasonable time frame that's VC oriented, you, you need to raise a lot more money than you probably think. It, it doesn't work here. I think, yeah, I agree with you. I, first of all, I completely agree with you. I think it doesn't work here because like the problem in Southeast Asia is like, it's not one market, yes, right? it's fragmented, which is a really, yeah. it's, it's a really reductive statement, but I think a lot of people don't really get that. From the West, I agree. They, yeah. They, they want Asia as like package and they think it's just one block. Yeah. It, they're they're like, like, oh, Southeast Asia, you know, 600 million people. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, yeah. That's the same easy. story you always yeah, hear. Yeah, you know, but <laughs> yeah. like, I mean, so that, that play only works in, in Indonesia, but Indonesia has a host of other problems. Yeah. That's challenge. a different story. That's a yeah, different, yeah. right? Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's a problem. So like the money that you would have spent to scale in one business, it's not replicable or it, it there's no, knock on effects. You have to do it all over again yeah. in a completely different market, which is to your point why, yeah, you always need way mm. more money than you think because essentially you have to do it like five times. Correct. Or however, you know, yeah. X number of times equal to the number of markets you're operating in. Yeah. Right. And that was always, I think the, that was also a challenge with Althea too. It's like, because you go into a new market, you start from scratch. You have to build your customer database again, your influencer network. Yeah. You have to acquire all your customers all over yeah, again. Correct. Uh, and so, yeah. Which I think that points to the genius of, of how Rocket executed. I mean, they, I feel if you're doing global expansion, majority of playbooks, like, I feel like Uber just took all the Rocket people scaled in that kind of way. I feel like, like that was like the first person who really kind of wrote that. And uh, a lot of people tried to recreate that. But like, honestly, like you, you do want some sort of central control on certain areas. Yeah. You want a person, portion of autonomy. You want to hire the best. But like that playback is like pretty tried and true, I'd say, you know, at least for that period of time. And it does apply and maybe in a different flavor now these days, because of course things are a bit more mature now. But, but, um, I don't know. Global expansion. I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting question, right? Cause actually I haven't thought about this question in a long time. Like if you were, if I had to, yeah, if you expand, were to expand globally, to, yeah. Well, or if it, regionally, maybe minus, minus the COVID. If you take out the whole COVID, yeah, part, yeah, yeah, cause yeah, that, yeah. that's like a, the, yeah. No one can plan for this, right? Yeah. Like, how would I do it again? That's a, it's a great question, right? If I were to do it all over again, for all, in, 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 like, I can only speak to Althea, right? Yeah. Korean beauty context. Yeah, Korean beauty context, right? I would have spent all of my time and money and attention building a huge Korean brand or investing in Korean IP. Well, I feel like, um, 
for a specific vertical, it makes a lot of sense. Yes. Because that's how you win and build a molt against these kind of big platform apps where the, the play is price and assortment and convenience. Correct. Well, that's exactly right. what it is. It's a yeah. vertical, it's, it yeah. was a vertical play, right? Yeah, exactly. That, yeah, it's a vertical yeah. play. Yeah. It's in the context yeah. of a vertical play, right? Okay. So, 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 so say you, the first layer is you build this kind of like, uh, IP and brand. Mm. Then what? Because like you could look at Gojek, you could look at Lala Move and, and you could look at Grab and you could look at Rocket. The way they all expanded, all quite very different, honestly. But that's, but so that's the difference, right? And this is the power of brand and media. Right? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. if you own, so IP, unlike those other things, is transferable. Yeah. To, to a certain extent. There's obviously limitations to it, right? Yeah. But like, I mean, Korean, Korean drama or Korean mm, culture. content, culture, culture is the prime example of this. Korean culture. That's a perfect point. Is it's why you have an opportunity for Korean TV. Right. Yeah, yeah, correct. It translates broadly across like, almost all geographies, mm, right? Mm, mm. And then part of that is just, it's just human nature, right? The stories yeah. that they tell, it's the same human stories, yeah. right? And it's been told for thousands of years. Yeah. Um, so if I were to do it all over again, I would have probably just focused on creating like content in Korea mm. with a slight South Asian easier bet. So just like you become like a dominant or like a player in Korea and that would have like natural carry on effects. Right? Yeah, fair but enough. then also ch- ch- fundamentally changes the business. Then that becomes like just like you're just a Korean beauty business at that point. Correct. In Korea, yeah, 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 yeah. No yeah. longer a Southeast Asian Korean beauty well, business. This, this plays to the thesis or the idea that you need to build a machine first, then you could expand. Yeah. Which is like Alphabet, yeah, or, or, or any, anything else who is like Amazon, right? Yeah, correct. Know, where, 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 where the lines start to blur, right? right. It was the wrong game, right? Because yeah. we started yeah. off just acquiring customers, and then we tried to build like a brand and IP behind that. After on um, trying to as, go back, you're as, trying to go backwards into the yeah, we tried to back in into it when really <laughs> yes, exactly. I've made this mistake so many times. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, exactly. We've all done this, right? Everyone who scaled enough businesses has done this, yes. right? We we'll really just start. Well, the the guys who are famous today probably got it right on the first luck, luck, like lucked into. Well, they lucked into yeah, it, right? Into but, it, but we had to learn a hard way. Well, it's, a, it's like one of those lessons that you only understand after if you, you go comp- through it. If you go yeah, through it, right? Yeah, because, like, yeah, yeah. let's be honest, like everyone thinks we're smarter than everyone else. Yeah, right. True, like, true, true, like true. everyone that does, all entrepreneurs have like uh, unreasonable inflated you need sense. that belief though yeah, yeah you, you need, need to have, like you know yeah otherwise you wouldn't do it you wouldn't do it you wouldn't do it yeah exactly if you yeah. didn't have it you wouldn't do it i and think that's also the weakness right because yeah. then you're like ah it's okay i'm unique yeah yeah i'm special like i yeah. will f- succeed where everyone else has failed but then which, that's like a which, terrible which is important that like for like us who are low level quote unquote like we haven't quote unquote made it as big as famous people the important thing is to hold on to that belief that naivety right. yeah yeah because it, it's a matter of just keep keep doing that yeah and, and reinvesting until you kind of get it right eventually correct. and of course doing it better right exactly it's about internalizing yeah. your mistakes correct obviously uh, again reductive but not making the same mistake you made last time okay so let's let's go back what what was the main learning then from Groupon? What was the most important thing you could have gotten from Groupon that people can probably benefit from hearing? You have to understand what game you're playing. Okay. Right? And I didn't understand okay. what game I was playing. Right? Not to be fair, like uh, when I first joined Rocket, I didn't know what a business model was. I, I didn't know who a tech was. The only thing I knew was finance and hedge funds, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. But sure. you got to know what you're doing. No, no, no. no not, not, I'm not doing sorry. You, no, know not, what, yeah. you have to know what game, what game you're, you're playing. playing. Right? I went in there... Uh, thinking as like i wanted to as a builder right okay I, and so like a lot of my conflict and a lot of my emotional uh you know whatever was because i did not understand that the game we're playing is essentially a game of financial engineering it's a very good point um right and if i could had i understood that or had a, i accepted that's that that's a really good point right i would not like i would have been able to go through it and be like oh you know okay it's fine this is what we're doing you know just yeah, it's fine. You know, do it. I mean, you, obviously, you have to opt into that, right? So if you understand, so yeah, first of all, you have to know what game you're playing. Hindsight 2020. You can't, though, yeah. yeah, you yeah. can't have 20. But, and, and then obviously, you have to decide whether you want to play that game or not. Opt yeah. in or opt out, right? Yeah. But if you don't know, then that's where your conflict comes from. And that's where your emotional turmoil comes from. Because essentially, what's, what's happening is like your, your mind is, is doing one thing, but your heart, Mm. is doing something else and you're doing this divergence right and then that's where like you suffer like well in, in the in the case of rocket um i think that understanding the game was important that's why we lost right share yeah rocket could have been probably the biggest winner of right share like we should have been the dominant force in southeast asia 
we could, we could have we could have just plowed more money into it. Yeah. We, but there was, but they, they their their mindset of the game was that they had focused on they were, they were playing the game. And they were focused on food, which was right. Maybe a little bit of timing. I think timing. Maybe, yeah. I think now, now is even better to probably to be looking at food and getting into Correct. it and Correct. trying to IPO it because you get better valuations probably because it's more mature now, right? Yeah. Um. But but that that idea is that like we thought we could have probably done it and succeeded, but the problem is it was just a game, and but like they were not looking at it carefully, so we lost it. Yeah. Correct. Right? And on, on the other, on the other point, Jetsbury, wrong foundation. The, the company I was building more suited the marketplace yeah. for travelers and, yeah. you know, um, I should have realized that it was also a different kind of game because of the foundation, but Correct. I bought into it. I thought I could make it work. Yeah. See, that's, Le- led to a lot of pain. Again, that's, that's, that's yeah. where your pain comes from. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You have to understand what it is, what the game is. Yeah, what the game is. Yeah. Right. And Which, that's, yeah. yeah. Which means I think it's coming down to whether you're an investor or whether you're building it, it comes to, Doing enough of the work to have clarity of it before you start executing. So many Correct. times that I started ideas that were just like, oh, I'm just, go-. and I think this is what Peter Thiel's criticism of lean startup is that people don't really fully understand it. Yeah. So they go in circles and iterate to value to nothing. Yeah. Whereas he's saying having the longer approach, which means I think having enough clarity, there's always going to be the point. I heard this really good podcast where this guy's doing vertical farming, but he says you got to do enough homework up to the point where you know enough, but then you, ha- there is that point where you reach where you jump into the abyss. Yeah. Right. Of course, you're going to always reach that abyss, but a lot of times people don't even do the homework. They just jump into the abyss. What's what, easier? Right? What, what, yeah, what happens is you end up calling backwards into a niche, end up calling backwards into an idea. And I think the best entrepreneurs had a lot of insight and clarity, even if they were wrong, that they knew that then they could just, um, once they figured out it was wrong, you already have a foundation based on how to pivot because you already knew something. Correct. I, I, I think that's a very important point is you yeah. have to have clarity yeah right and i find that to be a huge weakness in the in the industry in the region i think that a lot of founders and a lot of a lot of vcs uh well don't name any names (laughs) don't have it i completely agree yeah it's i mean it's a region because this ties back to the idea of uh indefinite pessimism uh or indefinite optimism Mm -hmm. yeah in the region we're still and theoretically going through a period of indefinite pessimism for southeast asia where you're you're trying to copy. Of course, it's a little bit blurred now where we're kind of maybe transitioning to where people start to try Silicon Valley style stuff in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Right. But what probably what happens is that because of like rocket internet, because of all these trends and because of all these models that get huge money. Yeah. It's just the herd mentality and then people just trying to copy it and you get a lot of noise in the investment side and the building side. Correctly. I mean, that's a problem. That's a problem. It's just like, it's just, there's just, I mean, I think everyone would agree with me why it's like, it's just too much money. In the ecosystem right now. So is it better to be an investor or a builder? It's a great question. I suppose it's depending on your risk profile. Yeah. Like my risk profile and my personality, I, I learned this a couple, in the last couple of years. It's like, I definitely prefer things on the investor side. Yeah. I think you have the skill set for two. And I don't know. I don't think you have any baggage of wanting to build things. Right? Do you, do you want to be the, the, the founder, the, the no, successful guy? No, like you don't have that, right? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't need to feed my ego. Ego is unimportant. I don't think I need to, but, uh, low key, I probably do. <laughs> right? So that's a question, like, I'd uh, rather be rich, is what I'm saying. Well, okay. The, well, you could be rich either one. There's just different odds and probabilities. At the same time, you might be better at one or the other. Okay. Right? So, I, yes. To, okay. To your point. I think it's about understanding the types of problems you want to solve yeah and the type of work the nature yeah. of the work that you want to do and let's be honest as a founder typically the problems that you have to solve they're really not that interesting right yeah i'll give you an example right like like you know how many times have you had to like figure out the customer service process flow right i mean like or acquire merchants for your platform well, this is exactly or, why i didn't join shopee again <laughs> yeah but this, is, this, is, this is my point right like yeah. what kind of like and it's obviously trade-off right obviously it's it's incredibly rewarding and to see something grow right and you take pride yeah and this joy and like yeah. oh the number goes up every day and whatever right but the, the flip side of that is like you have to solve problems that i personally have no interest in solving anymore Right. I've done it and I don't, yeah. I've done it. I've done it in enough where I don't feel that like it, it, there's no sense of achievement or accomplishment in doing that anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whereas on the other side, like on the other side, you're like, it's more, it's a bit more scientific, right? Yeah. It's more philosophical. And I think this is like where my upbringing and my background comes in. Like I come from a family of phys- like doctors and, yeah. and scientists, right? So you have a thesis yeah. and you go and like you try and prove your thesis. 
or you yeah. try and validate your thesis. And that to me is more interesting intellectually, which is not to say that this will apply to everyone. So that's what I'm saying. You have to understand like what type of problems do you want to solve? Yeah. I mean, this was interesting because I heard a Justin Khan podcast and why he became a VC now mm. was because he had the hero complex after he sold Twitch, mm. right? He wanted to do it again like because he wasn't the CEO of Twitch. And then, uh, and technically it came from his co-founder Emmett, uh, okay. but he was just like, he, he founded Justin Khan TV and Emmett was part of that, but then yeah. it somehow spun off, right? He needed to go prove himself. So he, he raised, did. he lost, basically raised a hundred million dollars and lost it <laughs> on uh, Atrium, right? Yep. yep. And, but then he realized uh, in his journey of like, you know, uh, self-discovery and that's kind of stuff, like, which is his whole podcast. But like uh, he realized he was fighting that notion and he was better suited. Like all the things he liked just lined up to him being an investor. Yeah. Right. And then, correct. So, is, is, I mean, is that, I mean, in, in, in some kind of way, you're kind of seeing the same thing, I guess, right? I'm, that's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, for me, like my driving, uh, if, if I were to be honest, I have two driving motivators in life. Right? Yeah. When it comes to this, right? Intellectual curiosity yeah. is a big part of it. Yeah. Right? I agree. I, I can see that. I yeah, can see intellectual that. Intellectual curiosity. Uh, and if I'm being, you know, truthful with you, I'd like to be right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good motivator. Knowing your motivations, of course, is very important. Correct. But I think what I like about your story on this is that it's a very bottom up approach, right? Mm, yeah. You like, so Justin Khan's almost kind of top down where it's like, uh, looking at a big picture going down, like, Oh, I looking at my big ideas and what I follow. And then I should have done this. But then he's like, Oh, then I should be, but you're like more like thinking about like, uh, your journey leads you up into becoming what you think is best for it. I don't know. I don't I know think, if that makes sense. No, I, I get it. I, I think you're right. I mean, it's actually interesting because my, this is the, the, maybe the, best advice my, my dad ever gave me yeah right so i got laid off from my first job at the onion in oh, 2000 okay. and yeah. uh, 2009 yeah because i was doing the financial crisis i right? kind of want to know about the onion story yeah I, I, I'll, <laughs> tell, I'll tell you about it so yeah so I, I got laid off in 2009 because i mean this is during the the peak well peak financial crisis well that was, in theory the end of the crisis because nine was in the bull market started to happen there were still some after no. eight, 2008 was like when it hit but Right. Yeah. End of 2000. And then like, it was kind of end unfolded of, and crashed. End of 08. Yeah. Then, then 09 was the very beginning of the bull market. Like the, no, it wasn't. The bottom. No, 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 no. It was not. It was Ooh, not. Look at the stock prices later. I, I know. I was trading. I was trading yeah, back yeah, then. Yeah. I know this. <laughs> no, because I remember, I remember like 08. Yeah. 08 was, 08 a, was in the middle. Was, was middle. Cause that's like when Lehman collapsed. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, so the way, yeah. So maybe fair enough. Maybe nobody. I mean, you're still feel, it's still bad. It's still bad. It's still bad. It's still bad. Right. So, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. I got laid off in 09. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Right. Um, and that was like, that was a reconciliation, right? Because like the onion was my dream job. Ah, very interesting. Okay. Yeah, that was my dream job. So How, why is that your dream job? Because I grew up in Wisconsin. You grew up reading the onion. It's, that's it's, fair. It's, 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 uh, it's, equivalent, it's yeah. the equivalent of like working for like Walt Disney if you live in Florida. It, it basically was founded in Wisconsin. Yeah. It had legacy. It was, it was created in the eighties. Yeah. Eighties. It was a cool. And the, was it getting traction back then? Cause it wasn't as big as it is now. Like now it's a cultural, well, so, look, it's a cultural aspect of America. Yeah, now, so like, the we, onion, I, right? I can get into a whole dissection of the onion, yeah. right? But, but like, suffice to say, like you grew up, this is like, yeah. I, I, mean, I think like, it's a beautiful story because it's, it's beautiful, very, very organic. Right? Yeah. And then the, the, the story is like, you know, like, where did the name come from? The name of Onion to... Little oh, bit I want to hear this. Little bit of I trivia. read this online. Little little bit, I want to hear your version. A little bit of trivia. So, the, what people get told sometimes is it's called The Onion because there's many layers to it. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The real story is <laughs> when the founders started the company in the late 80s, they were so poor, they yeah. could only eat onion sandwiches. Yeah, okay, okay. And well, that's the, that's the So, actual. that's the version you heard, right? No, that's, just, that's the version that's true. Uh, do, did you talk to Tim Keck and Chris Johnson? Do you know them? Or Tim Ke- no, the founders? They? Fa- oh, sorry. They're from the eighties. You wouldn't know them. Right. They weren't around. No, they weren't around. Yeah. yeah they weren't yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because apparently one guy, one of the older, like OG guys of the onion said, Oh, that's debunked. They, they said it was probably like a play on a different name of something similar to the onion from another media outlet. They thought was like uh, mm-hmm. a satire of it, but there was one story of the onion sandwich one. That is the story that I got from the owners at the time. Okay, so okay. That's, I, I'm just okay. Well, I'll, let's, I'll, go, I'll go with that. I'm Straight gonna, from the I'm source. That story, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll that's go like with a pretty that. reputable source, right? Because yeah. they bought it from those Correct. guys, right? Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Who knows, right? Whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, I was laid off in 09. Oh, sorry. Uh, we should probably say, what is The Onion for a global ah, audience? So, so for the global audience, if those are unfamiliar, The Onion is a satirical media publication founded in the late 1980s in the yeah. US. It is um, essentially the OG of satirical of modern day satirical uh comedy media, yeah. media in the u.s so this is like in many ways and i think even stated this is what inspired 
like John Oliver, mm, uh, John Stewart, correct. uh, Colbert, right? Yeah. The, all, the, they're the OG. They essentially write real, like, okay. Uh, like they write full proper journalistic articles and uh and, like it's actual satire. news yeah but it's but it's a, satire so it's, it's not whole, real correct yeah. it's a whole news yeah. uh, sorry it's a whole newspaper printed uh weekly at the time uh, obviously not anymore because it's not the reason newspaper anymore yeah. but it's all fake news or all, yeah, satirical, yeah, fake, satirical news satirical news satirical news, not, news. Yeah. Satirical news. And, and then there's been many instances where the onion has predicted the future in yeah. amazing ways yeah <laughs> at the same time it's uh, there's all these uh, subreddits dedicated to people falling for the onion, which people, happens a lot. Yeah, that people happens. read the onion; they believe it's true, but it's like uh, it's a satire. It's satire right? yeah, so you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't believe it, right? Yeah, so. yeah. It was. It, yeah. I mean, it, like I said, it was, it was my dream job. Yeah, and and the point is, okay, so you are doing what? So I, I'll give you what a was quote I doing there. I'll give you a quote. Sure. Dave Chang stood for a beacon of hope at the onion. Written by one of the recommendations <laughs> on LinkedIn by your friend. Right. Why, why are you a beacon of hope in the onion? <laughs> what does that even mean? I mean, this is okay. This is a uh, different context. This is 2007 and 2009. This is like pre. Okay. okay internet okay. is kind of like developing, yeah, but yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, like I'll, give you, I'll yeah. give you, I'll give you the context. I'll yeah. give you the context. Okay. Um, can I finish my father thing real quick? Yeah. Okay. It's my father thing, right? So yeah. I got laid off in 09 and I had no idea what to do. Yeah. Right. I mean, like I was 24 at the time, got off my dream job. The uh, economy was, was terrible. And, you know, it's the same. It's like, it's essentially like, like almost op- option paralysis. Part yeah. of it was option paralysis. And the other part was just like fear. Yeah. Right. And my father gave me the best advice ever. And he just said to me, like one day we're having dinner. He's like, hey, look, man, you don't need to know what you're going to do for the rest, next like 10, 15 years, but just like yeah. start doing stuff. And if you don't like it, move on. Yes. And it was great advice. Like yes. I, it was great advice. I, I took that. Uh, I don't know if you know this about me, but I went to architecture school what? for a while. Yeah, what? I, I enrolled in Berkeley. Dude, I love architecture to, too. Uh, to be an architect, I, it turns out I'm kind of terrible at architecture. Which which aspect? Because I so in high school I took drafting, and I thought I wanted to follow the path of architecture. But then someone someone told me, oh, you need a lot of math. But my math was terrible, oh. as, as you know. No, my issue I think was um, I enjoyed I I think I sometimes lost the forest through the trees. Okay. Like I, I would get into this place where like I would <laughs> architecture is like this, this beautiful fusion of all disciplines, right? It's like yeah. you, you, you take a little bit of everything, like it's from like biology, from physics, from engineering, from math, yeah. from arts and you, yeah. you create beautiful structures, right? My issue is I would think I would get over focused. On one component. Of you should have been things. an engineer then, no? I should have. Yes, correct. That yeah. is that is that is the converse of that. What, what is the equivalent in a startup world? An architect is a product manager of sorts. It's basically, product manager. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. So you're you're coordinating between the engineer, the design. Yeah, you have to understand a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you need everything. You got to put it together, and right? You synthesize it into one thing. Yeah. But the, I think at the end of the day, it's a beautiful manifestation of humanity and the zeitgeist of time and, yes. and what people are feeling and. Which uh, I kind of wish there's more of that in uh, different parts of Southeast Asia. <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, I mean, also, if I'm being honest, I also am terrible at that part of it. Yeah, yeah, The yeah, tapping yeah, yeah, to yeah, the yeah. human emotion yeah. part. Okay, okay. So right? you, because, because like, well, I mean, this is, this is tough, right? Like, the best architects, the star, star architects, like yeah. star architects, right? They're able to evoke emotion yes. through space, which that, is powerful. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 When you see it, you, you feel it. You feel it. If yeah. you've ever been to, like, a Remkul Haas... Uh, building or Caltrava or any yeah, of these, any yeah, of these like, yeah, famous yeah, guys. Yeah, right? yeah. You go in there and you just, I mean, obviously it depends on where you go and the exact building, and, but you're just, you're all like overwhelmed, right? You're just, yeah. you're just like, you're kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you sit there and it's like this sense of like amazement and wonder and yeah. beauty. It's art in a sense, it's right? Art. It yeah. is art. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And I realized I could never do that. Well, the important thing is that your your father told you to try it. I tried it. The important yeah, is I tried, tried it. it. Okay. And then opened more doors. It was right? not that great. So let's go do something else. Yeah. Okay. So what did you, okay. That, okay. That's a good point. How did you jump from the, like you're grew up in the Midwest. You're a Wisconsin boy, whatever the hell that means. You were in Minnesota. You studied in Minnesota. Again, still Midwest. Still Midwest. Very cold. Yeah, yeah, cold. No. Uh, great experience. Like you told me before. How did you end up in Beijing then? How did you make that uh, jump? That, that's, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting story. So I knew this guy called Oscar. I met him while studying abroad in Hong Kong. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So you did a, uh, an exchange program at uh, HKU. Yeah, HKUST. Yeah. HKUST. And Oscar <laughs> had gotten a job at Groupon. And uh-huh. Oscar, I got, I got the job through Oscar. Okay. So, so it's usually a friend Good, old, goes, good old yeah. fashioned nepotism. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I feel like, you know, I, I really think about my, my whole entire career in history. Like 
the only time I ever really got a job was interviewing with Raf, Raf the, yeah. the, you know, the MND of Groupon doing rocket expansion. Other than that, though, like that was just perfect timing. Yeah. But other than that, though, like I had only gotten it through probably connections or people coming to me at the right time and right place. I, I, well, that's, that's I suck it. at interviews. Like, that's what my current job is, uh, yeah, right? It's right yeah. in my place. Yeah. yeah. Like, right. I, I realize I, that like I, it's also part, maybe like, uh, subconscious, like I sabotage these things that I should, I don't think I should be doing them. But like, uh, I feel, Whoa. I feel like the best opportunities have only come because it's just serendipitous, right? You know, through the network, through people. So, well, let's be honest, right? This is also a function of privilege. Yeah. Right. Like you, like I was, I've oh, always okay. been, in, I've always been in position. I don't know about you, but I've always been in position where I've never had to take a job because I needed money. I could um, always, I could always okay. wait the, for something that I've, I found okay, interesting. Well, I think the first job sets the tone for that. That, that's super critical. Yeah. Like if you have a job where you've even like any amount of small savings, you are kind of landed in that position. Correct. Okay. And that's a function of what ladder you were born into. Yes, right. the so of course, three yeah. ladder, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the Michael Church, yeah, um, yeah, three ladder. Theory yeah, right. So of course, of, of course, if you're mostly middle class, as long as you have landed that kind of first gig, Correct. then you're kind of set where you have the privilege to Correct. quit at any time that you Correct. want. Of course, there's a, for the more middle class you are, the more time limit that is, yeah. unless you find a way to solve that. Yeah. Well, that's this is this is this is the thing, right? I think a lot of people in in life don't understand this fundamental dichotomy or this fundamental construct that. You trade in a job. You trade your time for money. Oh, I realize that very. Early. A lot of people don't realize yeah, this, right? Yeah. And I, I feel like that is like the biggest disservice that anyone could do to themselves. Yeah. Right. And because once you understand that, and of course, it depends on how much you value your time. Yeah. For someone like me, I value my time very highly. Yeah. Right. I only take on projects that I find to be obviously you have to pay, but you know, intellectually stimulating. Yeah. But I felt you were very. I, as a friend, and I realized this over years, that like you're very, like, also someone like June, like the episode two, you guys are very good at being able to value and ask for what you, cause you, like you said, you value your time very well. Yeah. But you're not afraid to ask for it. Correct. For well, me, I'm, no shame. For me, I'm, for me, I'm more willing to just do whatever, but it, it works in the sense that long term it can pay back, but lots of times it's very questionable. Like, you just did nothing for, just, you know, just to help. Right? Well, so I think this is, this comes from a, a I don't know about June. I I know for myself that I got here because I feel like I got shortchanged too many times. I feel ah, like I got fucked, right? And so then ah. uh, after you have that happens to you a few times. No, no, like, it happened to me many times. That's yeah, exactly. that's why I realized it. Yeah, yeah, but then I have a big ego, so I'm like, never again, mm. right? And okay, then, and then because you remember that emotion, you remember like how how bad that feels. Yeah, right. And you're like. Mm. Mm. But I also got a good lesson from the Jesuits. So my, my school is Fordham University in New York oh, City, yeah, right? Yeah. And one of the biggest things is the way you serve yourself is by serving others. They force you to do volunteering, fair you enough. take philosophy, you take theology, yeah, enough, right? Enough, so, enough. and I, I think, um, I've always taken that approach to heart, you know, ever, I mean, I, I it kind of sense I've, I, my personality is like that, but I feel like, like once it's codified, I feel like that's, a, that's the right way. And it, I think, you know, when, when you're very genuine about going that kind of way, it works really well, I think. That's fair. Look, I, there's, there's no value judgments here. Yeah, right? of course, of there's, course. But I, I think like for me, it's like the way I look at it is like you can't help others until you help yourself. That's also a good point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like it's not that I, I, I don't know. I, I did a lot of volunteer work in yeah. high school. I taught refugees in college. Yeah. You know, but at the same time, right. Yeah. You also have to ask yourself like, look, if you truly want to be impactful, like let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest. Let's, uh, let's, decouple the emotional and like feel good vibes of yeah. like charity and nonprofit work. Yeah. And you really think about like as like someone of means, what is the most effective way you can really give back to society? Yeah. I mean, unless you have like some very specific skill set, maybe time, but nine times out of ten, it's just cold hard cash. Ah oh, man, we're talking very philosophically here, right? Because we're talking about people just look. Uh, it's this is the story of the starfish. Uh, Carol Robbins, fam- famous um, Stanford professor, talks about her teaching the touchy feely method, mm. right? Like, which is interpersonal dynamics, essentially. Sure. Yeah, right? sure. Very good podcast. Podcast. If you just search Carol Robbins, there's a lot of stuff on her. Sure. I'll put on my uh, list. But she she tells a story of um, you know, in in the distance, she sees this. Uh, okay, there's a story of this little this woman. She sees a guy in the distance. Bending down, standing up, and it, it looks like he's dancing or something. As she gets closer, she realizes he's picking up starfish and throwing them back in the ocean. And there's millions of starfish that kind of got washed up. And she says, "What are you doing? You're crazy. You can't do anything." He's like, uh, "What's the point of doing this?" He he looks at her, pick, looks down at the ground, picks up another starfish and throws it, and says, "That made a difference for that one, right?" So the point is that 
it makes a difference, even if, if it's just for that one person, right? Sure. So, I, but so yeah. there, there is meaning in doing volunteer work or even contributing, even if it's just one on one, it does make a difference, right? And I, I guess for Cal Robin, she, she took the story a little bit differently. She's like, well, my goal is to make an army of starfish throwers. So everyone just starts throwing starfish, right? <laughs> Okay, I get it. I get yeah. it. I think I think the way I'm looking at it is, is, is essentially the framework is effective altruism. Yeah, because I I honestly hear your version a lot. It's like if I become Bill Gates, I can do a lot of good. Sure. Yeah. Right. But I mean, yes and no. Right. There, there's more ways to do it. Like it, it, it may not have as much impact, but that's what it, for what for what purpose are you doing it for ego or for what? But that's, right? that's but that's exactly my point. Is like what is the purpose you're doing it for? Yeah. Right. So uh, and again, there's no value judgment. So like yeah, if you do it. And you want to do it with your own time and contribute like your time. That's fair, right? Well, you want the connection, right? Yeah. You want to feel good. You want to make the other person feel good. But you, the point is this. What if everyone did that? What do you mean? Everyone spent a little bit of time helping other people. That, that compounding effect is massive. Whereas but I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. I agree with you, but I'm yeah. saying like sometimes it's more effective if, if you're a person of means to donate your cash or your assets as opposed to your time. Like Bill Gates. It, Bill uh, Gates is a great example of this, right? Yeah. Like Bill Gates. Bill Gates, he's given via the Melinda Gates, Bill Melinda Gates, he's yeah. given, like, I don't know what, like 40, 50 billion dollars yeah. at this point. There's no human way, because he's not like a, a vaccine yeah, or a yeah, researcher, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no human way that he could have matched that contribution by donating his time. You mean impact wise? Impact wise, correct. Impact wise. Because it's, it's, it's about, it's, yeah. it's about effective enough, yeah. right? Because we're looking yeah. at, I'm looking at, I'm looking at this from the frame of value. And like, what is most effective? Okay, yeah. if, if that's what your goal is, yes, exactly. Like, I how do know. like theoretically, like, yeah. how do I help how, the maximum? How much of that is an excuse for yourself to serve yourself? Fifty <laughs> percent. <laughs> there you go. We're being honest, right? But I, I, I don't think it's okay. This, it, I mean, if you want to be you know, as reductive as possible, you're, you're just talking philosophy, moral philosophy at that yeah. point of you know, is it is it right to have motive or not to do something to do good, or is doing good in itself good enough? Right? I think doing good in itself yeah. is enough. That's yeah, okay. Enough, fair right? enough. So, it it yeah, shouldn't yeah, matter why you want to do good. Like I mean, yeah. if you good, I mean, I truly believe that nothing is truly altruistic. Yeah. You. Can't be that reductive. It's, exactly. it's, it's holistic. At the end of the day, it's somehow tied to some reason why you're doing it. Yeah, whatever. Exactly. Whatever you have your reason. So, so as, as long as the good happens, it's probably better. And the more, the bigger. Imp- so it's almost utilitarian. That's right? but that's yeah. Right? That's exactly yeah. what I'm saying. It's ut- it's about yeah. value, Fair right? Enough. Like maximum okay. utility. So you're maximizing utility, and yeah, that's the correct. philosophy. Fair enough. Fair that's enough. a philosophy. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's go back. You left Groupon. Then, ah, yes. Hey listeners, thanks for listening to another episode of EOA. If you enjoyed this episode or learned something new, please share it with your friends and family. Give us a rating on your podcast platform. Share it to anyone who you think would enjoy or benefit this episode. So what do we learn in this episode? Technologically driven bundling and unbundling. I think there's a lot more to flesh out as there are many ways to conflate the idea. Though, if I do understand the basics correctly, it seems we are amidst a great unbundling of radio in the podcasting space. And as we mentioned, creating and owning IP in that space will be extremely beneficial. We can start to see this in the fight to control distribution between Apple and Spotify as it heats up. However, there is a possible future where more innovation happens and independent media is able to survive on its own and directly distribute, driven by all the technology that's developed in the space. If someone has deep insights on economic bundling and unbundling, I would love to hear from you. Stay tuned for part two where Dave's journey continues with plenty more insights. See you soon. EOA out.